don't want to know. We're dedicated yes. to our favorite shows. Oh, my circuits. Everybody loves hip photos. Scary dog. Pearson at Blurred Ball. Futurama. Good evening. You are listening to a Rattledge and Broadcasting premiere podcast TV party tonight. I'm your host, the mandated reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Rattledge. And tonight, our favorite show is Dark Side of the Ring, brought to you by the good people at Vice Media on the Vice Network. Joining me tonight, as he does for many things related to wrestling and other things related to boxing and some things related to TGIF, the the no, stuff on the television, not the restaurant. Ladies and gentlemen, the punchy pugilist, Pat Mullen. How do you do, sir? I enjoy various things, don't I? You are a renaissance man. So, we didn't get a chance to talk about Dark Side of the Ring, and for those who are just fans of the network and listen to everything but don't quite know what we're doing tonight, it's a documentary series that uh, follows a subject matter in the world of professional wrestling. Uh, it takes, it's about a 45 minute show. They talk to various talking heads throughout the industry. A couple of uh, repeats would be Jim Cornette. He's on there a lot and he's talked about it on his podcast ad nauseum. Uh, they've talked to The Godfather, they've talked to Mick Foley, etc. So um, the first season was narrated by Dutch Mantel, except for the one that was narrated by Mick Foley. The second season was narrated by Chris Jericho. And uh, they deal in the unsavory back room, background stories of various professional wrestlers uh, or incidents or companies. So the first season, Pat, let me ask you a question. How did you find out this thing was even in business? Because, like, uh, it's on Vice, and Vice is trying very, very hard to get noticed uh, they pushed their own programming really hard during this, and there was a fair amount of, fair amount of marketing that went into this. But um, if I hadn't been following wrestling news, I don't even know if it, w- it would have been on. So how did you find out that this was a thing? Yeah, I found out about it like you kind of through the, the wrestling news wire. Um, uh, I think it was particularly because they were coming out with the Bruiser Brody uh episode um first and they were going to release it online before the actual airing of it so you could see kind of what the show was about and so i went to i went through that and uh that's when i figured out that one they were going to air this and two that it was actually going to be uh i don't want to use the word like mini series but it was going to be a short anthology series basically uh, of six episodes with no guarantee for future episodes but uh there was going to be some interesting things they went through on it so uh, I was curious, and, you know, the Brody story was obviously a good one to kick off with because I think a lot of people over time have heard the story and not really known all the details of how that murder took place, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that episode proved it wasn't going to be kind of either a hatchet job scenario or, like, gratuitous schlock. They actually want to uncover what happened. There's a flair of dramatics with this. This isn't like the A&E documentary on the history of pro wrestling which I liked and it was narrated I believe by Steve Allen um, it was on it was the the real story of professional wrestling yeah I liked it and I don't think <sighs> one could argue that had a tinge of mm, wrestlings for those people but <sighs> if you weren't looking for it you might not have seen it and you actually do learn a lot in that and I think Steve Allen handled it well or whoever wrote his prose um, that was fine. Then you have, like, Beyond the Mat, which is, like... <laughs> which, if you want an ugly portrayal of pro wrestling, there you go. You have wrestling... Imagine which... if The Wrestler was a documentary. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Wrestler being a the movie starring... Oh, gosh, what's his nuts? The actor. Mickey Rourke. Thank you, Mickey Rourke. <clears throat> then you have Wrestling with Shadows, which started out as... Or is really... he's no... Or, or as Mickey Rourke is known in Beyond the Mat, Jake the Snake Roberts. <laughs> Notorious piss drinker. Jake the Snake Roberts, as Brian Last calls him. Uh, you have Wrestling with Shadows, which uh, started out as a very nice thing. Anyway, here's a picture of Bret Hart. Isn't he wonderful? Doesn't he look like himself? 
and then the fucking Montreal screw job happens, and this thing takes a turn, boy. Uh, Side note on, on Wrestling with Shadows, I've always tried to find the song that closes that documentary where Brett's walking with Stu, mm-hmm. and I've never been able to find it. Uh, you gotta sit. I know the name. I know the artist. I've never been able to find the audio track. Oh, you can't. Oh, like it's on Spotify or anything? No. Oh, that rats. Well, um, like I said, documentaries uh, and wrestling have always been kind of a shaky relationship. So, I would say, judging by the first season, we're gonna talk about that just a little bit before we jump into season two. I would say they're pretty even-handed. It's like, here's what we believe happened, here's what we've researched, here's what people are telling us, judge for yourself. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't take a strong point of view, and when later on when we talk about the Jimmy Snuka episode, where there's clearly a moron covering up a murder, <laughs> and they're just like, well, that's what he said, <laughs> don't ask us, we weren't there! So, um... It, it, it's not telling you pro wrestling is bad. I don't... It doesn't necessarily put pro wrestling on a pedestal. It just says, here's the thing that's out there that people enjoy. Here are some shitty things that happened in it. So, <clears throat> so for the first season, six episodes, in the order uh, that they were released, as far as the series goes, it started April 10th and ended May 15th. Starts with Randy and Elizabeth, Randy Savage. The next is the Montreal Screwjob. Then Bruiser Brody. The Von Erics. Gino Hernandez. And then it ends with the fabulous Moolah. Uh, I watched this with my wife. And it's one... My wife and I don't watch a lot of things together. Um, She likes a lot of, like, the Outlander, Downton Abbey, Rain kind of stuff. Or trash television, like... Everything on Bravo. Except for Top Chef. That's cool shit. But, um... <clears throat> so she... So, the like, the one, like, in the Venn diagram, the one thing we kind of land on the, a lot of similar stuff is wrestling. And she also watches the show Snapped. So, she's like, oh, documentary about shitty things. I like that sort of thing. Hey, wrestling. Put them together. Voila. We, a show we can watch together. So, she watched the Randy and Elizabeth episode. And... Um, I don't know. I don't remember a lot about it. It was sort of alluded to that Randy was a bit... Um, there was a lot of domestic violence being alluded to, but nobody saying anything, like, directly. I don't know. What did you think of the Randy Elizabeth episode? I was very paranoid about that episode, uh, ironically enough, because of Randy's personality as described. Um, but I I came away with it where... The only person who I think really kind of went outright to try to bury Randy in some way was Linda Hogan, which is understandable. Mm. Um, and I, I think they were not a reliable historian, though. No, she is absolutely not. She definitely most she most definitely has an agenda. Um, but I think to the same point, there were people in there, and and you know let's let's be fair about the balance. Like Lanny would be completely on the opposite side, and they interviewed right. him. Uh, I think they had people in between who were doing things that supported kind of Randy's actions, like where Eric Bischoff was like, no, Randy didn't want his wife around the locker room of guys in the 80s who were doing terrible things, nor would I want mine. I probably would be just as protective. Um, And then you balance him out with like a Jimmy Hart who was on Hulk's payroll to this day. And, oh, Randy was paranoid, baby. He had her... He had her locked up for 21 days with 21 TV dinners, baby. You know, like, <laughs> I, I thought it was balanced. I don't think either side came out looking better than the other. Um, but I was happy with the fact that they didn't immediately just try to portray Randy as, like, a paranoid, abusive guy. Yeah, I got, yeah. The, I, I got the impression that Randy is very type A. And, you know, you're not dealing with a room full of psychologists here. You just you know, people with agendas who memories are what they are and, you know, saw what they think they saw and neither one of them was alive to be like yeah this this happened no it didn't so you know it's kind of I think at I think at best you know you have a protective husband in an in in an industry that can be carnivorous um that can be lecherous uh at worst he was probably mentally abusive I don't believe he hit the woman 
but uh, yeah, I, I have a very hard time believing that, with especially how much we saw her on camera. Yeah, um, I, I, I highly doubt that, and I, I don't think, I don't think. Uh, well, we'll get to that with the Road Warriors, but I was also going to say I don't think at that point in time, if he was abusive, they would let that play out on TV. But you know, we, we can get to the Road Warriors at that point and just kind of shoot that sure. in the head. Um, I just want to like touch on the rest of these, and then we'll move on. Uh, they did the Montreal Screw Job which this is the one that made me fall in love with this series. And I've watched it. This is the one I've watched on repeat several times since it aired. Like before season two started with Benoit, uh, I actually rewatched the Montreal screw job again. I don't know why, but this subject, I, you know, if God grants me one wish in life to make a movie, this is the movie I want to make the Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels drama to me is like, and, and you, you might be listening to going, ugh, whatever. But I really do. Like, the, the fascinating story of the guy who thinks he's, like, the son of the company, who then becomes, like, jealous of this hotsy totsy other guy, and then is summarily dumped shit on and unceremoniously thrown out of the company, <laughs> which is the story of the Montreal screw job. Like, I would love to see a dramatic representation of the perceived or actual relationship between Vince McMahon and Shawn Michaels that led to Bret Hart who thought he was like the golden child dumped on his ass and I thought the documentary episode of this did a fair job of telling that story and the nonsense that happened that led to well fuck it we'll just fuck him in the ring I, I I think that, and it was unavoidable just because of the nature of the production. I think it was slanted towards Brett, you know. Sure. Um, and you're and you're talking to somebody who believes that Brett was largely the one who was wronged and not necessarily in the wrong for his port for his stance on the whole issue, um, based on the circumstances we now know and have been confirmed by all parties involved. Um, right. You know, I, I think again the most culpable person in the whole thing is Sean, yeah, more so than Vince. I, I, I think if you drew a circle on, like, the incident that really... Because, like, you could spend forever going through the backstory, but the, the story where Brett goes to Sean and be like, I just want you to know I'm never going to hurt you in the ring. And I have no problem doing business with you. And Sean right. goes, that's great, but I'm not willing to do the same for you. Right. At that point... Like, <laughs> you little you little <laughs> prick. Like, At that point, how do you not throw Sean out a window? And how yeah, and, and, and how is Vince McMahon, do you not go... Apologize or you're fired, you fucking idiot. Not not even not even that. I don't care if you apologize or not, but you know what? I'm probably not gonna ask this guy to do the job for you at that point. We're probably right. gonna just put the belt on Steve or Shamrock or whoever right. and then transition it to you to transition it to Steve. Um, you know, whatever. Um But but again, I think all all things considered, if you're Vince, you're playing with your company's, you know, standing by having a guy who holds your belt potentially jumping to another company with that belt. And regardless of your personal relationship with Brett at that time, you had Flair do it. So your thought process is why wouldn't you Brett do it? Right. But then Especially if, if the you're Vince thing. McMahon, you have to be a raving asshole yeah, to, if to go into November when you knew in August this was going to happen. Yeah. And, and not take the belt off of him. Like, let right. him, whatever. Sean, you're just proving that you're a selfish prick and you really don't like Brett. And you're going to do this out of spite and just lose a lot of respect from a lot of people by doing it. Well, isn't and the real you don't care because you're a selfish prick at that point well, in time. Well, isn't the real story of the click, the, the story of how a group of guys could be un, unprofessional dickwads, just just a bunch of jerk-offs that are, that are not doing any favors for this company and hurting people along the way, and the boss is letting it all happen? Isn't yes, that the 100%. real story of the click? Yeah. So it's like... And I'm not defending Sean. Well, I can totally see where Sean's coming from. I do no wrong. I'm the actual golden child. I'm perfect. Everything I do, Vince says is okay. And justifies. I am a giant baby. So, <laughs> everything he does tracks. And, and that's why I kind of feel bad for Brett. Because going, that's why I started with going, going into all that. Brett was like, I, I thought you loved me. C clearly I'm wrong. And then throws a giant tantrum on the way out. A deserved tantrum, but a giant tantrum. Anyway, I thought the episode was really good. 
It's one of my favorites. Um, that's probably because I really enjoy the subject material. Uh, I know everyone else is sick of Montreal. Yes. Weirdly, weirdly, I'm not. Um, I still have questions. But uh, just kind of wrapping up here, the next one they did was Bruiser Brody, and I'll get your opinion on it in a minute. The highest rated one was the Von Erichs, which... Oh, you want to talk about something I'm sick of. <laughs> did you ever watch the Von Erichs uh, or the... It, w- it was the WCCW documentary on the WWE Network. Uh, I've seen that one. Um, kind of more a puff piece. There was another piece they did that was independent of WWE called Heroes of World Class. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I feel went much more in depth with everything. Um, it was probably the better of the two pieces, but they're worth watching together just to get an idea of the full story. But the, the only thing with the Von Erichs is like, you know, I like I grew up with this sh- this specter of death am- around the Von Erichs. Um, because I mean, by the time Kerry killed himself uh, in '93, like I was already watching wrestling for years, knew about his brother David, knew about his brother Mike. Uh, didn't really know that Chris had killed himself because that was kind of kept from me. And you know, that, I guess there was no need because Chris wasn't really a star. He was on TV, but you didn't really know who he was if you didn't pay attention to that territory. Um, and then Kerry taking his own life when he was facing a significant jail sentence. Um, it was just stuff I always grew up with. And I remember th- there was like a heel uh, columnist in one of the wrestling magazines who like his, his whole shtick was he didn't like the Von Erics. So David dies. He has to write like a column, you know. And then when Kerry finally killed himself, he wrote like a, a very sincere, like, dear God, please leave this family alone <laughs> article. And at that point, I was kind of like, yeah, I don't want to hear any more about this. And unfortunately, it was one of those things where the more I found out about guys like Kerry, uh, Kevin, who's the still living brother, though he barely knows it, uh, you know, Mike and, and Chris, like they were not good guys at all. Um, and it's kind of like, you know, I, I'm sorry for their family, but like I have no sympathy for them in a sense. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, what I know of the Von Erichs, because again, we all know I grew up watching WWE. So the first Von Erich I ever see is Kerry in the WWE, where he does not make much of an impact. Um, I actually, you know, he was the Texas Tornado because he had one foot. And I was like, yeah, all right. Um, but, but come on, more Ultimate Warrior, please. Um, I was aware of who Bruce, Bruce Brody was. I couldn't tell you thing one about him. So I don't know if that episode was any good or not, but... I enjoyed it, and, you know, I thought it was fine. No, I, I I think that was the high point of the season for me was the Brody episode. Um, they they put a lot of stuff in there that even, like, people who've tr- really been familiar with that story, like, that was one of the ones that I think everybody who was watching wrestling at the time, even if they didn't follow Puerto Rico, they heard about and knew. Yeah. And it was one yeah. of those ones that intrigued you and you found out more over time. And it's very hard to find stuff that I haven't looked up independently on some of these stories. But – the notion of Brody buying into the Puerto Rico territory as a potential motive was very interesting to me because I had never heard that. The guy he was going to buy the piece from, Victor Hovica, was very well tied in with the WWF, particularly Gorilla Monsoon, who was his godfather. Um, you know, these are details that I had never heard. And when you know Brody's MO and you, the thought of him buying into a promotion, well, the guy already doesn't do jobs when he doesn't feel like it. Now, if he has ownership in a promotion and you're expecting him to do some stuff, that's probably not going to work out well. And it's one of those things where I always made a statement and people have misinterpreted it thinking that I said Bruiser Brody deserved what he got. Absolutely not. That is not the case. But with Brody's history of doing what he did to promoters, I'm very surprised he wasn't more aware that something like this would happen to him if he crossed the wrong guy. Yeah. I often think about you know guys like Bruiser Brody because he's the kind of guy that Jim Cornette talks about. Like this was a business that used to be, uh, you know, filled with grown men, and I feel like every time he says grown men, he's thinking he's saying Bruiser Brody, Bruiser Brody, Bruiser Brody. But could you even yeah. call Bruiser, Bruiser Brody now? Like we're you know he's like I'm not cooperating with shit, and I'm gonna fuck people up if I have to. Like like uh, he, where you gonna go? Winkle. Nick Bockwinkle always brought up the point because he hated working with Bruiser Brody um, because of Brody's attitude with certain stuff. And Bockwinkle had a piece of the the Houston office at a certain point in time. 
So one of their big towns at the time was San Antonio because it had incorporated Joe Blanchard's territory. So Brody one night is working with, uh, I think it's Killer Tim Brooks and Buck Robley's in uh, Brody's corner or whatever. And Brody, I guess, didn't like his payoff. So he literally just sits down in the middle of the ring and holds a sit-in and won't sell anything, won't do anything. He's completely killing the crowd in the show. And it's one of those things where, like, okay, I get you're trying to get paid, but there are other guys who rely on this territory to make a living. And I'm not just talking about the promoter. I'm talking about the guys who are regulars in this territory trying to provide. And you're killing this huge town for them that people are not going to want to come pay again and see because you're doing this. Right. That's what I mean. Like, like that's, in, in the age of Twitter, this guy never gets booked. No, absolutely not. He gets blackballed pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, I had no idea who Gino Hernando was. I thought this was a fascinating story. And it began Dark Side of the Ring's obsession with mounds of cocaine reenactments. <laughs> uh, great episode. Uh, Gino Hernandez, amazing talent if you never got to see him in his prime. Um, but live young, live fast, live hard. And a great story, especially with how tied in he was to certain figures in the crime world that you would never know without watching this. I, this was probably my favorite episode of the first season uh, because of how much ground it covered, the amount of depth it went into for stuff that wasn't known, the fact that you had details like the fact that one of the pallbearers and eulogists at Gino's funeral was actively at the time on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Wow. <laughs> the Fabulous Mula, which was um, not the lowest rated. I mean, the, the initial episode, Randy, gets a 1.5, but I guarantee you that's gone up. Um, since then, you know, on like DVR and repeat views or whatever. Um, like I said, it it builds all the way up to the Von Erichs, and then it goes back down with Gino, and then they kill they they end the last season, the end the season one at a point two with Mula. Um, I have a place in my heart for Mula for two reasons. One, she looks like my grandma. I mean, she looked like my grandma when I was watching wrestling in 1987. Yeah. <laughs> um, big old Jewish redhead, uh, except that she's Southern. Um, in any case, so Mula also was part of the rock and wrestling connection on the heel side. And, you know, of course, she's part of the infamous uh, screw job of uh, Wendy Richter, if I remember correctly. She has the spider lady. Yes, she has the spider lady. Um, she was, but the reason why she holds a special place in my heart was she was one of the villains on Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling, uh, which initially I not loved as a kid. What was that? Initially, was not supposed to be. Oh yeah, they had a female talent that they brought in named Mad Maxine, who had like a punk rocker look, mm -hmm. but as she was a woman who stood six foot four. And had like a big mohawk. She was going to be the big heel to oppose Wendy Richter. And something happened with her and Mula where she was basically squeezed out of the spot. Mula got the payoff from the cartoon and Mula went back into active wrestling duty. And Maxine ended up going into journalism and even did a piece undercover as a member of the KKK. Wow. wow. Well, good for her. Um, there's a weird Vince Mula thing. There has to be. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, Vince, if you ever read a Playboy interview Vince did years ago, he kind of alludes to being, like, sexually abused by his stepmother. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not totally convinced that Mula didn't abuse him at a young age either, just for fun. Yeah. And he somehow just latched onto her. I, I Either that or she was, if, if you want to go to a positive standpoint, maybe she was more of a mother figure to him. Yeah, I would buy that. Was she was she part of his dad's territory for a great period of time? Not for significant lengths of time, but uh, as she was the holder of the recognized World's Women's Championship and essentially owned it, she would give him basically the female talent that he would use on his cards and be the female talent he would use on his cards mm -hmm. and on occasion and kind of took that entirely away from the NWA with the exception of a few southern shows like the Memphis area would use girls every so often. But really, all the female talent was being produced by Mula for the most part. And she kind of exclusively at a certain point loaned it to Vince. Yeah, there, there is a small group of wrestlers, male and female, Mula and Sean being two that we've discussed, that 
there's no other explanation for why Vince lets them get away with what they are visibly getting away with to people like you and me. God only knows what's happening where we can't see and have no access to. That, objectively speaking, he can't not have some kind of weird relationship with to let them do what they like do. Hawk, Hawk and Animal in a shoot interview they did in 2001 basically like said they could not understand how Sean got away with anything without being like sexually involved with Vince. <laughs> and Hawk, who was always the more boisterous of the two, basically said there's no way that uh, they, they they were not doing something homosexual. Yeah, I think even um, uh, what's his face there, Road Dog in like a shoot interview very offhandedly called Vince gay you know like oh these are all, are all homosexuals and there's a there's a Scott Hall thing where Scott Hall was talking about how Vince was pitching working with Goldust to him and they're like well he's gonna be like in love with you and uh, Scott's like no I don't wanna do that and Vince is like well let me tell you about my first homosexual experience <laughs> and Scott like says he didn't say this but in his head he thought like as opposed to your most recent <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't make me laugh, it hurts. Um, so yeah, look. I, I, and people are like, why is he laughing? Uh, one, patch delivery. Two, <laughs> like, if it, whatever screwed up thing, Vince, I actually genuinely feel bad for the guy. Um, nobody should be abused. And whatever torturous things Vince, ha- Vince has experienced that made him the way that he had been through much of the life that I saw him uh, is regrettable not laughing at him but that's a that's a damn funny line um all right so that's season one and it was it was did well enough on vice i mean look cable ratings in 2019 2020 are rough man uh it is hard to get an audience uh of any great significance so when you're the small little cable outlet called vice and you're pushing such luminary shows. Trump tapes. Most expensivists is where I was going to go. Or Bon oh, okay. Appetit. Big fan of Bon Two Appetit chains. now. Um, you know, this one didn't do too bad and did well enough that they were like, well, we uh, let's strike while the iron's hot here. Let's do a second season. And so now we're going to take these one by one. Um, let's talk a little bit about... Eddie and Chris before their tragic incidents occurred. Uh, Boy, uh, two guys I cannot feel more different about in how they're past. <laughs> I've told you my wife's story about Eddie Guerrero, right? Picking up middle school girls, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, but let me... Add, so, I didn't know about Eddie Guerrero until he showed up in WCW and he was one of 98 cruiserweights and he had great matches with Rey Mysterio and Dean Malenko and Chris Jericho and the other 97 mask guys. Um, I laughed at the Latino World Order thing and I thought it was adorable. And the alleged story of, like, Eric Bischoff throwing coffee on him or some shit also made me yes. laugh. Um, he showed up in the WWE, immediately like, fucking dislocates his shoulder. Um, I thought, like, initially the height of that guy's career was the stuff with China. Uh, like, WWE gave him the ability to show his personality and, you know, to be that, as WWE tends to do, that totally, like, racial stereotype, over-the-top uh, character. And I ate it up, you know? No, I'm not gonna... I'm not gonna lie about that. I His stuff with China as the Latin lover, I thought was hysterical. His stuff with Chavo, where he was lying, cheating, and stealing, uh, I thought was hysterical. And I was genuinely happy for him when he beat Angle for the title with the loose boot routine. And then JBL murdered him on pay-per-view and got blood all over the audience. Um, Benoit... Ugh. I liked his feud with Kevin Sullivan and then meh. <laughs> he had a fun series with Booker T there for a bit. Um, and then he came over and he had a fun, you know, series with Jericho. I, uh, I kind of didn't care after a while. I'm not a work rate guy, as you know. So 
I kind of favored Benoit. Uh, so, uh, so I kind of favored Guerrero over Benoit. Um, I didn't actively dislike Benoit. I just didn't care. But I will tell you, because I, I do have a soft heart, that when they both embraced at WrestleMania 20 with the titles, and it was kind of, you know, the workers' WrestleMania celebration. Look, we did it, Ma. We proved not everybody at the head of this company has to look like Hulk Hogan or Steve Austin. I was genuinely happy for those guys. It's one of the few genuinely emotional, like, happy moments I've had watching uh, wrestling. So um, that's kind of my 50-word or less take on these two guys going into their tragedies. What was your history with them? Um, So I was always a fan of Benoit because his style was very reminiscent of, like, the stampede wrestling style that I loved. Um, even when I first saw him in WCW in the early 90s, I was like, wow, this guy's a little different. He works a little more intense, he, and he's athletic. And, you know, he had this match with Two Cold Scorpio that I still remember to this day. That was like an eye-opening moment for me. Um, but I, I remember following, keeping tabs on him when he would work in Japan in the magazines, and then he showed up back in the States in ECW. Um, and just he he had this weird kind of charismatic look to me about him where he was a, a cruiserweight, but he was so muscular, but he was so athletic. And, like, I was really, like, anytime he – and he reminded me, obviously, so much of the Dynamite Kid, who I was such a fan of. And, obviously, that's not by coincidence. He idolized him. Um, that I was always just magnetized by his performances. Eddie, I had first seen in ECW wrestling Dean Malenko in classic matches there. And I knew he was big in Mexico, but I didn't know the level, and I didn't know his heel run there. Um, so I, I just knew him as this guy who had these great wrestling matches, and that's cool. And then he came into WCW around the same time as Chris and Dean, and he, you know, he kind of went through ups and downs with me there, just based on his use. I loved the LWO; I thought it was hysterical. Um, him reenacting the Bischoff coffee thing on Nitro was very like, "Ooh, look what he's doing there." And then he floundered, um, and even when he got to WWE, he floundered until the China thing, where he showed how entertaining his personality could be. But, you know, personal demons happen, and he got himself fired, and then his his redemption story in, like, 2002 to the end was really kind of awesome, and I really became such a huge fan. And at that point in time, I probably believed there was not pound for pound a better performer uh, in, the, in pro wrestling than Eddie Guerrero. And he kind of almost had, like, for me, a Randy Savage type feel at that point in time. Yeah, I forgot to mention his uh, feud with Rey Mysterio over custody of Dominic, which was hysterical. It was not good, but at least it led to a pretty good ladder match. Yes. So, um, I know exactly where I was when Eddie died. Yep. I was at, uh, I've been married before. This is a like second marriage for me. So this is wife number one. I'm at her friend's wedding somewhere <laughs> somewhere out there in Florida. And I'm in the parking lot. And, of course, me and the groomsmen. This is a dry wedding. This is a very religious family. So we're all... So, yeah, it, was, it really was. But me and the uh, other groomsmen, because there's no alcohol at the reception, are tailgating. Because we, we put the ass in class. So we're, we're out drinking in the parking lot, and I think I got a phone call is what happened. I got a phone call from a friend that was like, hey, have you heard? Where are you? I'm like, I'm in a parking lot outside of a church getting ready to go to a wedding. He's like, yeah, Eddie died. I'm like, you got to be shitting me. He's like, yeah. They just, like, found him dead in a hotel. <clears throat> and then it was the weekend, so... Monday, they did the tribute to Eddie, and it was very emotional, you know? Neither, I didn't hate either one of these guys. Um, now, this is, we'll get to it a little later, this is nothing like my reaction to Owen Hart. Um, no. But I'm, I'm a pretty empathetic guy. It's part of my training, also part of just my personality. And so, two hours of people crying about... Eddie had its effect on me and I you know I thought it was a classy show and uh, 
I was broken hearted that he had passed away. You know, I don't want to hurt hurt because it, to me, like an ideal, I deal with a lot with substance abuse, but hurt because he was a guy who finally overcame it and turned his life around, and it was just too late. Well, that's what happened, and like I don't, I don't want to put the guy down in death. Um, other than the one thing my wife keeps bringing up, but uh, that's the thing, you know, when you spend a decade or so abusing your heart it that, that's that, it's hard to undo that damage yeah please don't remind me of that <laughs> so that's the story for a lot of guys you know in music acting pro wrestling um sports is you live you hey. live fast and you die and you die young so yeah Benoit is a few months later, and this uh, is the, well about a year and a half. Okay, it's it's all while I was with my first wife, and that was not a long marriage. So <laughs> sure felt that way though. <laughs> it it really did. It was like a two year period between meeting her and leaving her. Um, so somewhere in the two thousand five two thousand seven bracket, uh, Eddie dies, and then. Benoit dies, and at first it's like, well, <laughs> we know the routine now. And then it was like, ah, cart before the horse. They find out after they've done the loving tribute. This this might not be so good. Um, what I, the, what all I remember about that is how poorly the news handled it, and how angry it made me. And like, of course, the face that I remember. <laughs> the worst of all was Nancy Grace. Oh God! Who bl- who basically that, that, bl- that idiot blamed the murder suicide on two things: steroids and being demoted to ECW. I don't know if you ever had the impulse to throw a shoe at your television, but that was mine. And <clears throat> and she said it to Chris Jericho. But when she brought up the ECW thing, Jericho looks like trying to contain laughter, which, which amused me. And then it was like, no, I don't think that was it, ma'am. But, uh, yeah. That was sort of my take on the whole thing was the WWE yeah, think- really didn't have their ducks in a row, and then the news media hates <laughs> fucking just Hollywood, and the news just fucking hate wrestling. And everything about it, and everyone in it, yeah. And use this as an excuse to piss on it. Like I can't like looking back in hindsight. Like I, I like just like you remember where you were when Eddie died. I remember where I, where I was when the news came out that Benoit was found dead. And uh, like I'm I'm looking at it, and I'm like, you know, they made the announcement and everything, and then they go into the tribute show that night, and I'm thinking, okay, they they know what's up, something happened, and I'm thinking, oh, maybe it was like carbon monoxide poisoning in the house. You know, because why? You know, obviously they're not going to do this if something was wrong. And then, uh, you know, the tinfoil hats and Kevin Sullivan accusations came out from people. Uh, can't say I was in that bandwagon, fortunately. Uh, but I, I like initially my thought was probably, oh, carbon monoxide poisoning. They found him dead in his house. You know, maybe he had heart failure because clearly the guy's on the gas. Who knows? And then they were like, oh, now his wife's dead and his son's dead, and I'm like. If it's not carbon monoxide poisoning, this is going to turn very ugly very fast. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, sure enough, that happened. And uh, you bring up Nancy Grace, which is funny because she's bringing up all, like, these young wrestler deaths and trying to blame steroids. But among the deaths she lists are Adrian Adonis, who was killed <laughs> in a car accident. Right. Not while driving drunk or anything, just driving in Canada. He was killed in a car accident. Uh, Owen, who we'll get to, and obviously there were no drugs involved in that death. Um, you know, just stupid things like that. Uh, like but, for, the, uh, for the news, it's an amazing lack of research. Yeah, but you know, we're living in an age where CNN is called the news network too, so go figure. Uh-huh. Um, you know, but again, like that just really showed a lot of ignorance to the entirety of everything and how little credibility they actually have when it comes to covering professional wrestling yeah. or anything involving it. Um, but you know there was the Benoit episode if there's any takeaway from it I had we were so oversaturated with news regarding professional wrestling and everything during that time in my mind I'm sure in yours too um, 
you couldn't get away from that story if you tried. Yeah. Um, relative to Nowinski and him doing the Head Trauma Institute and CTE, <clears throat> what's the timeline? Um, so that came about, I think it was after about three months when they finally got the autopsy through and everything, and, and Chris's father, David, saw the deterioration of Chris's brain. And I think and we find out in, the, in this episode, uh, based on conversations that Chris had had with Chris Benoit, that, uh, you know, he had kind of almost knew something was up with this. And so I think that's why Nowinski got in contact with uh, the father and we kind of get the involvement of CTE going forward and what the potential of that could be. And uh, by that I point, had, had Nowinski been out of the WWE with the, with the um, com- coma, <clears throat> with the concussion? Yeah, he had been gone by that point by, I want to say, uh, about two years, um, a little bit before Eddie died. And, uh, yeah, so it's about two years. And so at that point, he, he's really just doing this independent. He has, he's not with an agenda. He just wants some answers. Um, so they go through that. But at that point, it's, uh, it's about three months, I think, before we really get the concrete. Like, yeah, CTE is heavily involved here. Uh, But but his his stuff in the documentary, I really found very credible and with no motive behind it, just really laying out a lot of facts about what went on and potential theories. The other thing, which like I'll talk about the news saturation again, because again you couldn't turn on a channel without somebody saying something about this murder suicide. It was steroids. It was this. It was that. I had never read any of the books that came out that were published about the incident. We'll mm-hmm. call it. Um, but the stuff that came out of one of the authors who actually apparently did like very thorough research and everything, the stuff that like really chilled me when I heard it was that he, in the three days prior where he had committed one murder, then another, then eventually his own suicide, his Google search history that I didn't know about. And the two stories he, or the two things he had Googled was a, story in the book of Ezekiel in the Bible about a boy who was killed and resurrected and then you Google search on the most painless way to break your own neck (laughs) that was very chilling and told a lot to me and my takeaway from that at that point is CT is very real, the effects are very real we've seen like, and especially like you as a clinical psychologist, you understand the correlation between CTE depression depression to suicidal behavior well, and, um, don't, and don't forget you know you when you say cte let's call it what it is it's brain damage yeah it's again brain uh, damage and depression can get ugly very quickly yeah and but normally again it doesn't manifest itself as aggression it manifests itself in self-harm and yes. eventually in the extreme cases suicide which like a prevalent example would have been junior Seau in the nfl um but in this case, there was there was there were acts of aggression. His wife was restrained with tape and strangled. His son was drugged and strangled. I thought in the episode they had alluded to the fact that, and let me take a quick aside here. I thought this was a well done episode. I thought it was probably the be- one of the best between the two episodes of the whole season. I thought they did a really good job of telling Eddie's story telling Nancy's story, telling Chris's story, how Eddie's friendship with Chris and subsequent death, along with the damage Chris was incurring, and then, and this is the point, this is why I went into this aside, the troubles he was having with Nancy, which could have been the result of his brain damage, you know, his inability to cope, deteriorating could have just been the natural course of a marriage one never knows I wasn't there but I had gotten the impression from watching the episode that 
it was at least pointing, alluding to part of the reason that there was aggression towards Nancy, aside from the brain damage, was the two of them were having difficulties, and he was very frustrated with her. Yeah, and there was, and one thing that wasn't included that I do know, there was an instance where uh, police were called on Nancy uh, for hitting Chris. There were instances of, there were multiple instances of that back and forth that they didn't, for whatever reason, include. And I know, again, to probably to get the compliance of Nancy's sister, they probably didn't want to include that, you know. But it's very, it's very easy to do the research and find it. Um, but you know, there's a lot of ground to cover in this, and especially with kind of almost making it an Eddie dark side of the ring in addition to Chris. Yeah. Um, y- there's a lot to cover, so I can understand not having everything. I could under, and again too, there there was also an instance where the police were called against Nancy involving Kevin Sullivan. Um, so you know, I know they lay a pattern of abuse at Kevin's feet, but you know, Nancy had also had the police called on her against Kevin, so it's not necessarily a totally one way street. You mentioned Kevin um, Sullivan, and I just want to—I don't know if anyone who listens to this also listens to the Jim Cornette podcast, but Kevin was on it, and he was asked directly why he didn't say his side on the show, and apparently, like you do in some cases, he has a relationship with Nancy's family, having been her husband. And he sought their permission and did not have it in time to do the show. And so without their blessing, he did not want to add more hurt to this family than they had already had. And he abstained. Yeah. And and again, I think that's a very fair thing he did. And I'm glad at least he had some forum to be able to put that message out there. Like, hey, this is why this was done this way. Um, Just to include, include as a quick aside. I was going to say, that's the most coherent I've heard Kevin Sullivan in years, by the way. Have you heard his podcast? Holy cow. Where he's falling asleep or, yeah. uh, (laughs) Doesn't make a lick of sense. GHB's a hell of a drug. But, uh, (laughs) (laughs) you know, but again, to go back to, again, just kind of underlining the point, you know, there's not really aggression, outward aggression when it comes to CTE, to, to depression, to suicide. There's usually not the veer off of homicide. Right. And to me, that kind of instigates, or not instigates, but basically confirms to me at least that there was a monster inside of this guy this entire time, and it just, you know, that that's in you. Uh, CTE doesn't create that. No, that's there. And the fact that those searches were done, and it means his brain was working coherently to do these things. So for all the blame you can throw on CTE to throw on, you know, steroid abuse, which I always laugh at because I'll always ask the question, how many bodybuilders do you see on death row? Yeah, I don't Uh, believe steroids had a part to play in this. I will lay some of the blame on CTE, but I will lay a significant amount of the blame on depression. And I I think it's a combination. You know, I think think this is somebody who is never very psychologically balanced in the first place. And I think that's what's the most overlooked part of it. Yeah, I would agree with that. We're not starting from a great place. Yeah, you look at Chris and his history... He is a very socially withdrawn person who, when he was in his, you know, in his parents' house living as a teenager, he asked them for a weight set so he could start building his body to become a professional wrestler like the Dynamite Kid. Mm -hmm. And literally that was his entire focus for years and years and years. That's not normal, okay? I'm not saying it's a bad thing if you want to have a goal and work to succeed at it. That's great. But he he was obsessive about it to an unhealthy degree. There's a great book called The Sociopath Next Door. And it talks about how our most successful people across the vast swath of professions have um, like personality disorders, basically, that they have like sociopathic tendencies. And, to, and you hear sociopath, you think, oh, Hannibal Lecter. No, that, that, that is a very oh, no. broad term. And, you know, like, to be as driven as you have to be to be as successful as some people are, you kind of almost have to be somewhat mentally ill. And again... Right, and especially especially you combine that in an industry where, and I'm not talking about steroids, but drug use runs rampant. Right. Okay. And I'm talking about recreational drugs for pain, for fun, for whatever. Um, you know, all that in addition to constant trauma to your head and body where you are constantly in a state of pain from working 300 nights a year. Uh, the few, you know, personal connections that you have, especially when you're, a very socially withdrawn guy like Chris Benoit, 
the few personal connections you have are not as strong because you don't see those people every day, uh, you know, outside of your work colleagues. It's, it's not a healthy thing when you're already going in there mentally unbalanced. Right. So, um, basic question: What did you think of the episode? Uh, well done. Uh, his son's his son's involvement is probably to me uh, really the most interesting part of it. And I, you know, again, I, I can't tell the guy how to reconcile his life or what to do. Um, the fact that he still looks at his dad as his hero is um, disturbing to me. And I can say that with clear conscience because, again, like, I had a very tumultuous relationship with my dad. Right. And yet he never murdered anybody uh, through any circumstances. He did a lot of things that make me not proud of him. And I can say that he was a very flawed person. He is not my hero, and I should not idolize him. I, I have a hard time understanding how Chris Benoit's son does not feel the same way. And it's somewhat disturbing to me. We all have to sleep at night, and we get to sleep through rationalizations and reconciliations. And I can't speak to his own mental health, um, so I'm not going to. I'm just going to say I'm not altogether shocked by his I'm shocked he wants to get into wrestling under that name fuck I heard Cornette talk about that and I'm like are you serious you know like please don't wrestle under the name Benoit um, not for another hundred please, years please do it in Japan where nobody cares yeah alright uh, so the next one is about New Jack the life and crimes of New Jack and I was aware because I work for XPW um <laughs> I was aware of the thing where he tried to murder Vic Grimes. <laughs> um, I did not see where Vic Grimes nearly murdered him. And I never saw the 911 incident. So I was very excited about this episode. And New Jack, you know, it, New, New Jack was probably the kind of child that my wife tends to favor and want to work with and help. I mean, he came from a garbage home. From uh, uh, from what he tells, and he uh, he go you know he grows up becomes a wrestler. He may or may not have been a bounty um, a bounty hunter. He ends up in Smoky Mountain, which again takes the idea of racial stereotyped over the top characters and says, "Hey, we're in the South. How about you agitate a lot of white people?" Okie dokie. Cuts, <laughs> cuts the greatest promo ever, by the way. Oh my god. Um, I think you know which one I mean. Yeah, it's one of the ones where if you describe it to someone who doesn't watch wrestling, you seem racist. It's so great. It's literally a... just shout out to my man, Orento James <laughs> Simpson. Keep up the good work. Two less we got to worry about. Yeah. I was thinking about that one. and <laughs> The one of him talking about eating chicken and watermelon and then doing it on camera. And then there's Mustafa, who, you know, looks like he's been sniffing glue. We'll get to that in a moment. So, um, so the story they're telling here is, you know, so you have this over-the-top guy in Smoky Mountain who gets over on being this uh, polarizing if character. If song was a person. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah, fuck the police was a person. Um, but then he goes to ECW where, and they made a point of saying this in the show, where everybody's over the top and everybody's a racial stereotype and everyone's kind of doing his shtick in their own way. And he's like, well, fuck, how do I stand out here? I know. Garbage can full of weapons. And that becomes his gimmick there for a while. And I have this lasting image of New Jack in my head of him pulling out a vacuum, vacuuming with it, and then hitting somebody and over then, the head with it. Yes, I, I remember him... Uh... I remember the vacuum, and then I remember he brought in, and eventually this would be a regular rotation in the garbage can inside of a shopping cart that he would push uh, a guitar, an acoustic guitar. I remember him taking it out, strumming it on each side of somebody, and then just cracking them in the crotch with it. You know, say what you will about New Jack, and people certainly have their criticisms. There are, uh, in the last 20 years of pro wrestling, let's go, to, let's go 30 just so we can make sure we can incorporate the decade he was actually in. In the last 30 years of wrestling, there are only a handful of guys that truly understand 
the business and what it is and what it takes to get over. Oh, sure, everybody can be trained to be a worker, and there are more great workers than I can count on this po- podcast. But very few guys who just have it and an understanding of what it takes it to get over. And New Jack is one of those guys. And he didn't care who was going to be on the receiving end of it. <laughs> no, he did not. So I had always heard the legend of the 911 incident. Um, not not nine one one. Um, gosh, what mass the transit. Mass transit. Yeah, sorry, I keep saying nine one one. I'd always heard the legend of the mass transit incident uh, with relation to New Jack, but I'd never actually seen what this kid looked like. Oh boy, I'm trying to not be totally disrespectful, but holy cow, Ralph Cramden, just like. I've heard, I, I've heard Devon Dudley say Ralph Cramden, yeah. and considering he's dressed as a bus driver, it's probably as good as we'll get. Yeah, let me let me take a brief pause here. Um, how familiar with you with New Jack? Did you watch him in Smoky Mountain? Were you a fan? Didn't get to see him in Smoky Mountain. Didn't get to see him until he came into ECW. Um, had always read like the the articles ranking the gangsters as the top tag team in SMW in the magazines. Um, but when him and New- and Mustafa came into ECW, like the Public Enemy had been the the big tag team there for a long time, and the Gangsters just ran a rough shot over these guys. As they where I'm, have. I'm pretty sure this was not cooperative. I'm pretty sure <laughs> Jack and Mustafa were just legitimately beating these guys up for fun. Yeah, uh, and they were so different than everything. And it, ECW is the land of. Especially at that time, like anything goes, but these guys were even more extreme than anybody else who was there, except for maybe Sabu. But the difference being, they were, you know, coming out to natural born killers and rocking Malcolm X shirts and Tupac shirts, and they looked the part more than maybe anybody ever. And they legitimately just beat people up and did it with weapons. They did it as you would do it on, like, the corner of like Normandy and Weston in South Central LA, like it was, it was different. It was bad. Like it was one of those things where, if I had to street fight somebody, I did not want to end up having to see those guys across from me. Like they just looked like they would legitimately didn't care and they just wanted to hurt people. Yeah, I'm sure there's elements of personality disorder somewhere in there. Um, but, but, but again, you're, you're talking about a guy in New Jack when you find out his story. Like, a lot of it makes sense. And to, this was the point in time where you could do that stuff. And sure. you, you would stand out and get paid, and they did it. And they didn't really, again, they didn't care who was on the receiving end. No. And they didn't really complain if they got as good as they gave until Jack kind of pulls the, the card of, like, if you hurt me, I'm going to just come back with something else and kill you with it. It's My- like, these are the kind of guys I tried to avoid. <laughs> So my wife is fond of, especially after seeing the documentary on him that the WWE did, my wife is fond of saying, I would have been Paul Heyman had I had half his motivation. <laughs> and I like Paul Heyman. He's one of my spirit animals. I really do. I, 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 I am fond of his presentation in wrestling over the last 30 years. But... I have some difficulties with him. Like I have, I have less difficulties with him than I have Vince McMahon. But I have some difficulties with some of his alleged decision making or absence of decision making in <laughs> ECW. And this is one of those where, like, was no one this driving the fuck? <laughs> was no one driving the fucking bus here? Was there? Was he just like? on cocaine and in the back and you know like the meme of the one guy from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia with the red string everywhere that everyone uses as like white people explaining things you know yes. what I'm talking about yeah I always feel like that's Paul Heyman like just coked up no pants on and explaining his booking with that in the background and they're like Paul we don't have Axel Rotten here fucking throw a kid in there like, you know, we have this kid. He works with midgets. Yeah, sure, man. Whatever. Woo! It's all very heavy. Yeah, blowjobs and hookers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we'll get to that in a moment. So, <clears throat> I just... ECW. 
there's a lot there's a lot you can say about it, but boy did an adult need to be running that ship. Because that adult was not Paul Heyman. Yeah. Because <laughs> if an adult had been running that ship when they brought the kid out there who was going to go by the name Mass Transit, who says he's 21, turns out he's 17, an adult would have checked that shit before he got anywhere near a ring. Woulda, shoulda, coulda. Yeah. And, nope. And, uh, yeah, now Mass Transit is dead. Well, before he dies, he... <laughs> And, and I'd love your your impressions of this. One of the things they talk about in the episode is, and Sandman's reaction to it is hilarious. It's like, oh, that's what pissed New Jack off? So, like, New Jack's ready to do business with this kid, but then this kid's like, there's a few things I want to do. I want to get my shit in, if you don't mind. And New Jack's like, Bleh! and somewhere in his antisocial mind was like, you've disrespected me. You've disrespected the business, and then makes this giant leap to, I'm going to cut your head off. Like, a normal person, there's one or two steps before you get to, I'm going to cut your head off. New Jack, right to it. Montez Ford-esque leap to that point. And then proceeds to cut his head off in the middle of the ring. Yeah. It... There's a time, you know, and since we're talking about New Jack, time honored tradition is not the norm of what you're going to discuss. <laughs> but in this instance, it is because the guys who trained New Jack and broke him in, you don't tell the veterans what you are going to do and what you want to do, especially if you are a last minute guy who's never going to work with these guys again. You're not there for any reason other than New Jack's going to get over by beating the shit out of you. You can be compliant and take it, or you can do something stupid, and now he's really going to hurt you. He chose the latter. And as a result, he almost bled to death. Yep. And New Jack would continue to work for this company. New Jack would be sued by this family and brought up on criminal charges. And this is an important detail. It might not seem like it, but think about what we were saying about, like, Shawn Michaels... And, like, how you can just get away with murder time and time again. And then you eventually just think, well, I can do anything because I keep doing it and getting away with it. So, allegedly, and they didn't talk too much about it, but allegedly, New Jack has more than one justifiable homicide. And then he gets off on nearly killing this kid. And you're already half crazy. I can totally see why, after Vic Grimes can't fucking execute the dive in ECW and it nearly kills New Jack why New that Jack he that, contemplates murder <laughs> that he contemplates he attempted it he says it on the show I was like I was trying to kill him I threw him off I was aiming for the floor and by the way having worked for Rob Zakaria, aka Rob Black in XPW I can totally see that happening Yeah, it's, uh, I, how Jack can say these things <laughs> and nothing has happened from it. Yeah, how is anyone, like, well, I guess no this one is, watching this, this decided to bring up fucking attempted murder charges on him. I mean, this is OJ writing the If I Did It book. <laughs> I kind of, like, looked at it. Christ, that's only the second time someone's brought that up this week with me. Is it, oh God! Um, but no. But really, think about it. I mean, OJ wrote a book basically saying, and "No, had I done this murder, this is how I'd have done it." In a murder where we all knew he was guilty of, this is Jack basically saying, "Yeah, I wanted to kill this guy. I just failed at it." Yes, I, I, I bungled the hit. <laughs> um, and then after that, we get the Jersey Joe thing. Um, yeah, Gypsy Joe. Gypsy Joe. <laughs> Don't, don't don't even want to get into that. Basically, Jack tries to kill a seventy year old man um, <laughs> for again. Like, there's no like you're a seventy year old man. I'm gonna let some of the mild racism slide. Nope. You've disrespected me. You've disrespected the African American race. Murder. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's, this episode is just basically a portrait of a guy who doesn't care. 
It just is going to do whatever. Well, again, <laughs> much like Benoit, you're not starting with a great base to begin with. You're, his base of sanity, it, you know, his, we, we always talk about this at work, you know, someone's baseline. His baseline level of sanity isn't good. It's shaky at best. And then you dump on top of it years of the kind of abuse you generally suffer in professional wrestling. Plus a ton of drug use. Like, he freely admits that. Yeah, he was talking about, like, being addicted to cocaine and alcohol, um, which, you know, life lesson, kids. It will alter your brain chemistry and will mess you up and drive you crazy. Um, and then, and at this point needs to be said, Vic Grimes landed, I don't know how far the fall was, but how, but 10 feet, 20 feet? How far did they fall in ECW? Well, uh, God, oh, God only knows. That was, I think a 20-foot drop. Okay, so they fell 20 feet through tables, and Vic Grimes landed on his face. Ass first on his face. Because okay. because in that situation, basically what happened was that that was a planned spot they were going to go through together. Vic all of a sudden at the jump gets cold feet, doesn't want to do it. Jack says, no, you're doing it. So Jack has to pull him physically to pull the spot off. And what happens is because Jack is pulling him and Vic is resisting and eventually falls, Vic falls on Jack's head and cracks his skull and blinds him in one eye. Right, so when you finally get to Gypsy Joe, brain damaged, alcoholic, cocaine, antisocial personality. Who's angry to begin with. Who's angry to begin with. <laughs> like, the man should not have been around allowed people, let alone wrestling. But that's not the world we live in. So, um... The highlight of this show is the fact that the subject is still alive and able to talk about himself. Yes, and the stuff he cops to, like, okay, pretty sure anybody who who had sympathy for this guy in certain instances, he's trying to wash it away. <laughs> I'm telling you, I deliberately wanted to murder this guy. I deliberately wanted to hurt this guy. I deliberately... Like, like, yeah, I felt good about stabbing him. <laughs> there's, no, there's no regret here, either. There's not, it's, well, I was in a bad place, and he did crack my skull, and at that time I just saw a red, but I regret... Nope. F he fucking said bombs away. Yeah, the reaction is going to be one of, you're either appalled by uh, his actions, uh, you're kind of like, oh, well, you know what? God bless him, he's copping to it. Good, he's an honest man. And then there's the part in between where it's just like, this guy's not well. I watched this twice. I watched this once by myself and was like horrified and hysterical at the same time. And then I watched it with my wife. I'm like, hey, Melissa, you want to see what a true psychopath in wrestling looks like? And her reaction, other than he'd have been a student of mine, was, look at his eyes. His eyes tell the whole tale. Did you how notice they're just, how they're just set and like intense the whole time? He has like legit crazy eyes. Yeah, like I, I know you're you're a Larry David fan to some extent. Crazy eyes killer is who you think of. <laughs> I was thinking of the, you know, the the character they nicknamed Crazy Eyes on Orange Is the New Black and Azusa Duba, whatever her name is. You're a lovely actress and all. You ain't got shit on New Jack. Good no. fucking grief. Jack, New Jack, I think the if there's a takeaway, New Jack is not a gimmick. No. I thought it was a there's well-done episode. New, New Jack is not a gimmick. I thought it was a well-done episode. Um, there's only... You can't write a good ending. You know, it either has a... It kind of has an ending, or it doesn't. And New Jack just kind of nearly kills Gypsy Joe and goes, Well, I'm going to go home now. And, <laughs> and that's kind of it. So it's an underwhelming ending, but that's not the documentary's fault. That's just New Jack. Yeah, and I don't think anybody really cared about it at that point when you've already been exposed to what you've been exposed to. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure like half the people watching it went and took a cold shower or went for a walk or went to go into the woods to live deliberately. Or, yeah, I was going to say, or hugged their children and were just <laughs> grateful to be alive. <laughs> all right, the brawl for all. I... Um... A, mo a quick moment to once again uh, send condolences to the Larry Zonka uh, 401 Mania family. Uh, he passed away this past week, and we we're all saddened by that. I bring it up because I begged him to be on this show, and my message got to him too late. He had, like, just finished recording. 
with Jerome Cousson, who I extended an invitation to be on tonight because because of Larry's untimely uh, death, he was not able to conclude their look episode by episode at this series, so we never got to talk about Owen Hart. I extended the invitation. He was busy. He declined, but he said thank you. So um, I begged to be on with... This is the only one. Like, I generally... I'm like, hey, Larry, I'm in the glass case. Break it if you need me. You don't live long and prosper. That was sort of my take with doing shows with Larry. I did not I did not beg. I merely made the offer. If he did not accept, great. If he did, super. Um, and with the stuff he does with other people, like Pantoja and Steve and Jeremy and Jerome, again, I tended to stay away. That stuff he does with those guys, I don't want to be a busybody. Um, but this, I had to talk about. Oh my god, I had to talk about the Brawl for All. And I was super excited. Like, I told you before, the Montreal screw job, I can't get enough of it. And like, I want to see it in a movie. The other one is the Brawl for All. I mean, we did we did a Brawl for All watch-along. Uh, we did. Some time ago. We did, and we, we talked, you know, briefly about uh, this clusterfuck. Um... So I was super excited for this episode. Like, I, this was one of the, I generally would watch it the next day with a lot of these, but um, the, bra, the Brawl for All, I stayed up late that night because I couldn't wait to watch it. And I'm not going to lie. I'm a little disappointed with this. Um, this is a very muddled story, and I don't feel like everyone participating in it is telling the truth. And I don't, and I feel like this was a great subject matter for this series to cover. But when it was all said and done, I kind of wish they hadn't, because I now know less than I thought I did about it. And I just, other than hearing directly from Bart, who has as much insight and you know as cardboard, like lovely guy it seems, but he. He just seemed like a fool throughout the whole incident while it was happening. And then he's like a, like a simple dude. Just like, well, here's my story. Eh? And then the other side of that is yet another pissing contest between Cornette and Vince Russo. And it's like, really? All this hatred for all these years of Vince Russo? This is the thing you, like, you most hate him for? So I... I didn't love this episode. I thought it was the worst one of the season, unfortunately. And it breaks my heart because I love the subject matter. Highly highly disappointing considering how much we love the subject matter of it. To the point where even before this was happening, we were doing a watch-along of a Brawl for All fight. And uh, (laughs) I think we thought we we thought about even doing more. um, But we just never got to it. But, you know, I I came out of this, and and probably because you and I, for whatever morbid fascination we had with Brawl for All, have done more research into that subject than most, um, we'll say. But I came away with, like you said, you, you came out of this knowing less than you did when you went into it. I don't think they shed any new light on this. I don't think they really came with any interesting takes. Uh, there were no real secrets involved here. I think that if there was one positive takeaway I had from this episode... It was that if true, um, it demonstrates a distinct lack of understanding by Vince Russo of the star making process. Because uh, when Bart knocked out Dr. Death, who basically they were engineering this tournament around, as we know, and Jim Cornette went, Well, there you go. You just flushed away X amount of million dollars, you fuckhead. And uh, Vince Russo was like, Well, so what? Now Bart's a star. <laughs> and Jim's reaction is one of you fucking idiot. You don't get it. Like that. To, that's probably the most interesting takeaway I had. Is that because if that is true, then Russo really doesn't understand how wrestling works. Yeah. Because yeah. again, you know, I, I always point this out to to it's and it's a real example, but it's applicable to this situation. When Buster Douglas beat Mike Tyson, Buster Douglas didn't become Mike Tyson. Right. And it's the same situation in this Oh, they instance. tried, by the way. There was all kinds of Buster Douglas merchandise. There was a video game, yeah, and uh, it didn't work. No. Because you don't... This isn't the Islander. You don't, like, kill a guy and take his soul. 
that you know you are still who you are. And when you look at, let's just look at the UFC, or even better, let's look at Fedor, um, in his dubious career in Strike Force. He gets submitted by Verdun, and his like air of invincibility immediately pierced. Verdun was then not known as like the Emperor or anything like that. You know, Verdun was still Verdun. It, he stayed the same, and then Fedor lost value. And then Fedor got his head knocked off by Bigfoot. And Bigfoot really didn't change after that. Nope. But Fedor looked like people started saying, like, maybe his career in Pride was a bit padded. Oh, and then, Don, then, then Dan Henderson knocked him out. Yep. And at that point, Fader had to go on a redemption tour, beating the likes of Jeff Munson. So, this idea that, oh, well, you know, we have a star in Bart. Like, I don't think Steve Austin was... Did they mention that, like, Steve Austin was not open to the idea of working with him? And when the fuck was this going to happen? Because, like... Yeah, I, I, which again, you know, even to that point in time, Bart Gunn had been a tag team guy with with Billy, the Smoking Guns, the Cowboys, whatever. Mm-hmm. They they broke up. Billy turned heel, and Bart was then just a guy wrestling in jeans. wasn't even a cowboy anymore. Aimless. Then they they basically played a mean prank on Jim Cornette, and uh, said, "Hey Jim, we're going to reunite the Midnight Express, but it's going to be uh, Bart Gunn and Bob Holly, and we're going to make them." Uh, Bodacious Bart and bombastic Bob. Uh, oh, there's never a way you're going to convince me this wasn't 100% a rib on Cornette just to make him feel more outdated and out of touch with everything going on. When was the finals uh, of the Brawl for All? That was, I want to say, August of 98. Okay, so August of 98, Steve Austin's in the middle of a feud with The Undertaker, which is then going to become a, a feud with The Undertaker and Kane, which is then going to become uh, the quest for the title where they make The Rock into the new big-time heel. Yep. In December, he fights McMahon. And then... No, uh, I can't no. remember. December was rock bottom. Um, but come... It, it, go ahead. They, yeah, basically, you know, Steve Austin is on a quest to gain back the title after right. loses it, you know, via screw job finish, and then The Rock is the new top heel... And then you build to WrestleMania with Steve Austin and The Rock. Right. And, so and, again, you know, I ask: between August of '98 and March of March, April of '99, when the fuck was there time for him to feud with Bart Gunn? Again and again, too. Let's let's point out that between winning the Brawl for All in August of '98 and fighting Butterbean at WrestleMania 15, how often did we see Bart Gunn on TV? Uh, you didn't. Yeah, exactly. But, okay, so let's say... Let, let's just assume for a second he was able to get out of the fight with Butterbean without having, without having you know, getting a concussion. Again, Steve and The Rock feud for, the like, the first half of 99. And then they transition into Steve versus the Ministry of Darkness. I don't remember what happened towards the end of 99. But, again, Steve's busy at the top of the card with The Rock and The Undertaker and Vince McMahon. There's never a spot for him. And I don't remember when he's, when him and Triple H became a thing, but that happened somewhere along the line, too. I want to say SummerSlam of 99 is, um, is the one with Ventura in, in Minneapolis, where it's... Yes. Uh, Three way, yeah. It's Steve, the mankind, and Triple H. Yes. So again, unless you're going to insert Bart into Triple H's spot, I can't laugh. I'll choke, but ha ha. <laughs> you're going to get into 2000 before Bart even there's even an open spot for Bart to fight Steve. And oh, by the way, Steve's fucking injured because he doesn't make WrestleMania 16. Duh. You know who's in the you know who's in the top spot at WrestleMania 16? Mankind, The Rock, The Big Show, and Triple H. So, 
like the tacit failure to recognize any of that by any of the people involved in this episode drove me up the wall. Well, and again, I, I think Cornette being uh, the fact that Jim Cornette's the most tolerable and listenable person to on the show about this is kind of scary. Uh, and, and again, he illustrates the the one point where even though we liked Brawl for All to a certain extent, he underlines the point that you're on a show telling everybody that, that what they're seeing is real, etc. But now you're going to tell them, okay, it's not real, and this is real, is inherently flawed from the get-go. He's, he's absolutely right. The other thing is, and again, you can't plan for your guy, no matter how Look at Kimbo Slice and um, the yuts he got knocked out by. In... Oh, Seth Petrozelli. Yeah, Seth Petrozelli. So the idea was for Kimbo Slice. Well, the idea was for Kimbo Slice to fight Ken Shamrock. But needless to say, um, the idea was to make Kimbo Slice a star. They threw in a guy he thought they thought he could beat, and Seth Petrozelli ends up upsetting Kimbo Slice. You can't plan for shit like this in a real fight. You have no idea how it's going to go. If people could plan for things, you wouldn't have upsets. Or you would, but there'd be a plan after. So the, the idea, So if there was really the idea that we'll use this as a vehicle to get Dr. Death over, at that point, especially if Bart is what he's saying is true, and I would believe him, he seems sincere, was willing to work shoots with uh, with Dr. Death, like he was willing to take dives, they absolutely should have took him up on it. To, if, the, if legitimately they were like, Dr. Death's going to beat everybody in this tournament, and he's going to be a big star, and we'll somehow interject him into the storyline we have with Steve Austin, which I've already outlined when, but <laughs> whatever. We'll get there eventually. Um... This company is run by a bunch of fucking assholes. Bruce Pritchard, Jim Cornette, Vince McMahon, Vince Russo, everybody at the, who was making the Jim Ross, everybody making decisions who thought to not gimmick this tournament if this was supposed to be a vehicle for Dr. Death, they should have all been walked out and, of the company. And again, not just a vehicle for Dr. Death, but a means to humble Bradshaw. Well, and that's the other thing. If that's really true, like, that's the pitch. First of all, Vince Russo should have been fired that day. Well, apparently it is the, the pitch because Russo completely goes along with it. Yeah, who knows? And that's the problem. Like, all the other stuff that happens in Dark Side of the Ring, I'm like, okay, that seems reasonable. I don't have any major... That was my problem with the Brawl for All episodes. Like, I don't believe anything you're saying in this. Because you can't all be this stupid. You see what I'm saying? Like... I don't believe Russo. I don't believe Pritchard. The only one who like comes across as like the mo the only two people that came across like the most sincere, but one of them seems a bit dim-witted, was Bart Gunn and Jim Cornette. Everybody yeah. else sounds like raving assholes and lunatics. I mean, The Godfather was fine, but he added nothing. No, nah, I just went and smoked weed and hung out with hookers until it was time to go fight. Yeah, how did he? How did they like not cut his interviews? Um, <laughs> This was the only one where I watched the follow-up. The, um... Oh, uh, what do they call it? The, uh, the Dark Side of the Ring After Dark, where they're all on Skype, and I'm like, well, I'm never doing that again. Have you ever watched those? No. Ugh, you're not missing much. They I can't... watched, I watched, um... Once in a while, during the first season, they would do an after-episode thing, and, uh, it, was, it wasn't bad, but uh, these ones are a little bit uh, self-indulgent. Nobody can hear each other. The, 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 nobody gets to say anything of any kind of significance, and it's just a waste of time. All right, anything else on the Brawl for All? Let's move on. All right, I've been talking for a while. I had a lot of, I had a lot of things to say about everything we've talked to up to this point. I got nothing here on Jimmy Snuka, other than this is a very sad tale. This was one of the ones where, like, if you were a wrestling fan... This is something that over time graduated from urban legend to, oh man, I wonder, I wonder about that. To oh, there's real evidence of this. To how did they not lock this guy up? <laughs> to 
yeah. If, if there's ever anything that has shown a negative light on Vince McMahon, uh, Vincent K. McMahon and his company, there is nothing greater or more damning in that light than this. Yeah. Um, like, come on. He's. Did you ever read Sex Lies and, and Headlocks? I did not. Uh, I've seen excerpts from it, but and the the funny part about this one too is there's there's stuff in this that they didn't even put in that paints it in even less of a favorable light uh, involving Buddy Rogers, and mm-hmm. I'll get to that stuff later. But like, uh, uh, no, I'll, I'll get to it now. Actually, so some of the stuff like they don't include in this is that uh, Snuka at, at one point in time and his wife uh, lived in in Trenton, New Jersey, by Buddy Rogers because Buddy really did have to mentor Jimmy and do a lot of things for him and apparently they were forced to intervene at Jimmy's house quite a lot when Jimmy would get violent with like his wife or whatever and this extended to having to intervene when Jimmy got violent with uh, the, the late Nancy Argentino and at a certain point in time if you remember if you were watching WWF programming Buddy Rogers disappears. There's not an explanation or anything. Buddy had been working as Jimmy Snook's manager on TV when Jimmy turned babyface, and they had uh, Jimmy and Buddy against uh, Captain Lou and Magnificent Morocco. But all of a sudden, Buddy's disappeared because he didn't want to g- deal with Jimmy's craziness on the road anymore <laughs> and needed to get away. He literally quit without giving notice, said, Vince, I can't do this anymore, and left because he didn't want to be essentially a handler like the to me it's almost where they got the idea for the character Friday for Kamala mm-hmm. or Kimchi when they called him later instead of calling him Friday when he had the, the safari hat on and the mask and yeah. it was Kamala's handler right. that was basically like I would be shocked if that wasn't a little bit of a rib with Buddy Rogers and Jimmy Snuka <laughs> this, this is an unstable guy who is in many ways a savage because he can't read or write English uh you know, is just a, a big cave, unfrozen caveman and acted as such. And then let's put cocaine and steroids and whatever else into the mix. And this is just a mess from start to finish. Yeah. And, and, and here's the whole thing. Like he absolutely murdered this woman. You have people on the show saying, I was there. She didn't fall. <laughs> you hear them. You well, them. You hear the Tonga kid say, "I was in the car. That never happened. I was in the room next door. I heard a ruckus, but I'm the Tonga kid. I didn't do nothing about it." And then she died. And then they're like, uh, "Then there's a coroner's report. There absolutely looks like foul play here." And then there's the sheriff. Of Vince, Vince Town, at fucking Pennsylvania, uh, he might as well have been named after him. He owned the fucking town, apparently. And it's like, well, what can you do? We we investigated it. You see, well, there's a coroner's report. Coroner Schwarner. We talked to people. We talked to Vince McMahon. We talked to Jimmy Snuka. He said Ooga Booga. We said we understand. And then case was closed. Like, the fuck? It's like, it's kind of like the New Jack thing where you just watch it and you're like, did I just hear him say they they knew she was murdered and did nothing about it? And oh, by the way, here's a big sack of cash. Yeah, ex- exactly. And then I think the even more disturbing than that in this episode is Jimmy's wife. Who adds nothing to the broadcast. Is like, she's, she's a toaster oven. But... A toaster oven in such denial. <laughs> yeah, and I like, love her line at the end. Yeah, I think I, I think it's sad that Jimmy never paid them. Like, you can't yeah. see it, but I'm blinking right now. Like, huh? Yeah, like, and, and it's it's to the point where like a lot of people are gonna be like, oh, she was okay with an affair. Well, here's a little secret that we're gonna let you guys in on. Most wrestling wives, especially the ones who are with the big, big stars, kind of know and assume that their husbands are going to step out on them. It happens. I think there's almost kind of a feeling of security in the, if, if they're with the same one for a length of period of time because it's almost that sick thing where you convince yourself, 
well, they can be committed, you know, that they're committed to them on the road and me at home, and that's what matters. And uh, it's almost like the mob with Gumars, I guess. It would be the most similar thing I could think of. But um, the fact that she's in denial about that, she's well aware of everything going on at this time, and then just refuses to acknowledge Jimmy's culpability in anything is very sad. Yeah. I felt really bad for the Argentino family in this. Um, I thought their interviews were fine. What were they going to say? Like, you know, she's a grown woman. She clearly there had been a pattern of abuse with her and Jimmy. And for the reasons that women stay with abusers, she stayed with Jimmy. And there wasn't anything the family could do about it. Were they going to do lock her in a closet? Like, they they were there. They expressed their sadness and their anger with Snuka, their anger with the company. And I thought the line of the night was, other than the stupid sheriff of, fin- of uh, Allentown, was, hey, this is Vince McMahon. Sorry about everything. How does $10,000 sound to you? Like, <laughs> like, this family and the fucking Vince McMahon. I was like, it is amazing what you can get away with when you have power and money. Vince goes in with a briefcase, walks out without the briefcase. Jimmy's not a murderer. Yep. And then, when this is all brought out again, as what happens, he's incompetent to stand trial. Like, well, at a point in time when it's way too late to be to really have anything done about it anyway. Yeah. And I totally believe that. that like, like, if there's one thing about that episode and about Jimmy that I totally believe, is that by the time that this happens... He absolutely was too too incompetent to uh, to stand trial, which is a legal term. Yeah, which I, I mean, between battling stomach cancer, you know, and undergoing chemotherapy and such, and then on top of that, knowing his limited uh, like intellect, read, they said, uh, uh, yeah, and intellectual capacity at that point in time, years before it, like the, there was never going to be a shot he was going to stand a trial unless they did it at that time. You have to understand the charges being brought against you. I'm pretty sure he didn't understand by that point how to tie his shoes. No, but at least also they were able to include that uh, that bit of him on Opie and Anthony describing the incident uh, completely different from how he gave another explanation of it. Just uh, disturbing stuff. What would you think of the episode? Uh, well done. They took a story that I think had over years become either expanded or embellished in such a way, uh, you know, to a certain level where they actually really ironed out the facts of it. The fact that how how did they let how did, you know, the Allentown Police Department let this guy go on camera? They used to work for them is my next question. <laughs> I don't but think the they, fact knew. That they were able to get as much as they did was really impressive. Yeah, I don't. I'm pretty sure after that he got a phone call about how he shouldn't go out in public anymore. Um, all right, so my memories of Dino Bravo were I couldn't tell him and um, Don Morocco apart at times. They both had that like bulgy, blown up steroid body, and I know they look nothing alike. But I'm a little kid, and there's a handful of wrestlers who all have that bulgy, blown up body, and I kept forgetting which one was Morocco and which one was Dino Bravo. Um, what can I tell you? But I remember him. I remember Frenchie. You know, they were, I remember him being, I think, in the tournament in WrestleMania 4. Um, he was kind of there. He was part of my youthful wrestling experience watching WWF superstars in the mid to late 80s. I had no idea that he was like the king of Calgary, number one. Well, uh, Quebec. Sorry, the king of Quebec. Number two, I had no idea he had been fucking killed in his home. So this was a learning experience. What did you think? So this was one of the ones I was really looking forward to because I think it's one of the most interesting stories that's never gotten a ton of publicity. Um. And the fact that they were able to do as much as they could with it while profiling still somewhat active organized crime is really impressive. Um, so, you know, for those who don't know, Dino and they kind of they didn't do this. Right. Like they said in the episode that it was Dino's uncle that was his connected uh, mob 
you know, person. It was actually Dino's wife's uncle who was heavily connected with the the Montreal, the Quebec mob. Um, and for people who don't know what a big star Dino was and how he was able to command such money for such a time, this did a good episode explaining. Excuse me, this did a good job at, uh, explaining his standing in Quebec wrestling. Uh, and again, Canada is a very wrestling oriented country where you, uh, you you really have to understand the culture there and know that like in in Canada wrestling is pretty much second to hockey and that's it. Um, so for Dino to be the star he was in the biggest uh, province there was, it, it's like being the biggest star in New York in wrestling uh, comparatively. And that's what Dino was in Quebec. He was the star, commanded a ton of money. And one of the more, you know, kind of notable points from this episode that people were like, wow, he was worth that much. He bought his four-year-old daughter a sports car, a legitimate sports car, and said, this is his, or this is yours when you grow up. But that couldn't be maintained. And when they talk about how he made the transition into mob enforcer, that's really cool because I don't even think a lot of people knew that level of his involvement. I think they knew that he had ties to them and maybe got involved in the business end. But he was a legitimate leg breaker for the mob. Um, and then to go further, he was involved in the very lucrative cigarette trade uh, on the black market there. And they licensed footage of Rick Martell, who didn't want to be interviewed for the episode for whatever reason, uh, explaining that according to what he had known, and I don't doubt it because he and Dino were actually tight, they were friends, they were big partners together in business, Dino got involved with this big cocaine guy and they went in on a deal together and they each started blaming each other when it fell apart. And the murder is probably the most interesting thing because... It, as they lay it out, the circumstances around it, where Dino was shot 17 times mm. uh, in a situation where there was no forcible entry into his home, his body was not tensed up. Very clear, this was uh, some type of professional hit uh, with people he knew and felt comfortable with who were willing to just take him out based on the orders given. And that's kind of something we 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 don't see in the show probably ever again. Mm. Um, how much of a fan of Dino Bravo were you when he was in either the Quebec territory or in the WWE, WWF? You know, I didn't get to, I didn't get to watch him growing up in the Quebec territory. It's one of those things where he would be on TV in the WWF as the bleach blonde, world you know Canada's strongest man, doing the bench press and hanging out with Earthquake. And I, you know, I didn't like him as a kid because he was a bad guy. And even though he's Canadian, I didn't like him. And uh, it would, but it would be funny because he would come on TV, and like my aunt, who I knew, uh, if she was over, you know, hanging out with my mom or whatever, she wasn't a wrestling fan, but she had been when she lived in Florida, and that territory was real big. And Rick, uh, excuse me, uh, Dino Bravo was a big star there with his partner at the time, Gino Brito. So anytime Dino came on TV, it would be like she couldn't tell you who the Ultimate Warrior was. She couldn't tell you who Hacksaw Jim Duggan was. But she was like, oh, Dino Bravo. I know Dino Bravo. And I'd be like, really? Like, that's the guy you know, Dino <laughs> Bravo? Who else? Like, there were a handful of guys in between 85 and 95 that had bodies <clears throat> similar to Dino Bravo besides Don Morocco. Off the top it, of there head. was a lot. It was it's kind of those guys who were like they were weightlifters and they were strong and then they got on the gas but then they stopped doing sit-ups and they, they they got very round and i remember as a kid like that that was dino bravo to me is like distinguishing feature was how round his upper body was same thing with don morocco like they just had very round and i know that's from steroids now but like like, I remember Ivan Putsky definitely had a bodybuilder's body, but he was super veiny and not nearly yeah, he was as conditioned. blown up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, these other guys were, were mostly rounded and bulky, and, like, uh, they gave the appearance of being fat if you didn't know them. Yeah. But it was just they were bulky. Um, they weren't conditioned. Yeah, it looked, it looked like if you ever see the old SNL skit with Dana Carvey and... Um, Hans and Franz. Yeah, Hans and Franz. You know, where how, how round they look and everything. That was kind of Dino Bravo and Morocco and some other guys in that era. Don't do steroids, kids. Unless your doctor prescribes them and they're in pill form and you have cancer. 
Um, David Schultz. You want to get big. <laughs> David Schultz. I had no idea who this guy was, and I like vaguely knew about the slap. But like on my kids, if you would if before this episode, if you like who did the slap heard around the world, I would not have known. So this was all new information to me. I had no idea this guy had had a relationship with Hulk Hogan. Um, and and I, we have to touch on it because it confused the shit out of me. Like, ah, why they went into his whole thing with Mr. T. But we'll get there in a second. So yeah, tell me about David Schultz. Tell me about what you knew of David Schultz and the slap and, you know, and what you thought of the episode. So again, Dave kind of got blackballed a little bit before my time. So the most I'd seen of him was on the Roddy Piper uh, videotape that Coliseum Video put out. And, you know, he's teaming with Roddy Piper in a couple matches. I think one is him and Roddy against Andre and Snuka. Um, and I'm like, Dr. D, why? this guy's in a high-profile room. Why don't I know more about him? And, like, this is one of the ones where I asked my dad, like, hey, you know, what? why don't I know about this guy? And he basically told me about the John Stossel thing and how he slapped John Stossel and it wound up getting Vince McMahon sued for like a quarter of a million dollars. So they fired him and they kind of just – nobody wanted to work with him after that because he was considered dangerous and a loose cannon. And I was like, oh, this sounds awesome. And uh, <laughs> you know, then I found out a little more about him, how he'd been in the AWA and was a big star there and was one of the guys that Vince brought over with Hulk Hogan. And how he kind of – like my dad told – my dad told me this before. Like it was popular to say he was like – you know how like Steve Austin was when he was feuding with Bret Hart? He goes, yeah, that was Dave Schultz before anybody knew that. And I was like, oh, okay. And when you go back and watch him in hindsight, that's absolutely clear. Um, there was a lot of that Steve Austin character with the volume turned up in David Schultz in a very different era. Um, and he was just a hardcore redneck to the end and a good athlete and a good worker – but a total loose cannon who just did not give a damn whether it was for his own good or not. And when he couldn't find work as a pro wrestler at a, at a high rate anymore, he became a bounty hunter. And apparently a very like, successful one. <laughs> yeah, like Bam Bam Bigelow was a bounty hunter who went into wrestling. Dr. D was a wrestler who went into bounty hunting. Um <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in this episode that – and because they're profiling someone who's alive and is the main subject, almost like with New Jack, Schultz – it's difficult to say whether it's just he's told these kind of embellishments so long that he actually believes they're true or he just is just hyping up to try to make himself sound better and tear other people down. I, I think the truth kind of lies in a little bit of a combination of both. Um. But, like, I, I know that there have been people who, when he's tried to say, oh, Hogan did this on the night I was I was taken out and whatever, uh, there have been pe many people who have actually come to Hulk's defense and been like, Hulk wasn't even on the show that night. So I don't know what you're talking about, Dave, um, type of thing, where he talks about the Mr. T incident when he was going to go take care of Mr. T in the crowd or whatever, um, and then the security grabbed that guy, all, all that stuff. It's, you know... It's Dave kind of telling his own thing and talking, and he likes to talk down about Hulk Hogan a lot in this episode, where Hulk tried to bury him and whatever. But Hulk's the guy who brought you to the WWF because you guys did such good business together in the AWA. It doesn't really add up to me that he would all of a sudden try to get you out when you're somebody he could work with and make money with, so, and are clearly not a threat to his position. So if I remember correctly, like his story is Vince told him. Not directly to go slap Stossel, but be in character and be self-righteous. And his interpretation of that was slap Stossel. And then once right. you and, like, and, smacked a journalist on, on network television, you can't, twice. <laughs> you, can't twice. you can't keep your job with a company that's aiming for cartoons and toys and ice cream bars. But, you just can't. But see, and this is one of the misconceptions over the years. The Stossel thing is not what got him fired. What got him fired? Allegedly him saying he was going to go after Mr. T uh, in the ring in a shoot. And basically telling a, a number of people this. And it word got back to the office. And like when he was going to attempt to go after Mr. T at the L.A. Sports Arena... Uh, Jay Strongbow and I think Jack Lanza were the guys who said, grab that guy. Do not let him go anywhere. Okay. How much of I mean, that do you Schultz. think is like Strongbow and the agents just being 
just kind of all forming a cabal and being like, this guy's a fucking asshole. Get him out of here. And we'll tell Vin... We'll, some combination of, we'll antagonize him just enough that he jumps to the conclusion to go fuck up Mr. T. And then we're going to tell the boss he intended to fuck up Mr. T so we can get him out of here. I just don't believe in my heart that somewhere between the Stossel thing and Mr. T, he was like, all the celebrities have to go. I don't, I don't, I don't know about that. Only because, again, like, he worked with Hogan and drew money with Hogan. So he's proven to be valuable in that extent. Mr. T, we know, had a lot of heat with a lot of the guys for how he carried himself. I, I just really, I really think that David just really got wound up and probably had a bunch of the guys winding him up, knowing who he was and well, what he's capable of. Well, yeah, I, I did say that. Like, I think a lot of this. But I don't was... even, I don't even think Strongwell. I mean, like the guys in the back. Like, I could mm-hmm. easily see like Piper, Orton, Orndorff, all these guys sitting around, kind of just stewing about what they would do. But do you think and, that's like, jealousy? Hey, what do, you do? do you think that's jealousy? Do you think that that's David Schultz is in a spot that I want? What if we trick this dumbass into attacking Mr. T and then he gets fired and then I get to fight Hogan at WrestleMania? I don't think it's jealousy of Schultz. I think they saw Dave as a mark who would go for it at no cost to them and get rid of, you know, T for them basically without them facing any punishment for it. So you think there was like a genuine like fuck Mr. T and the millions he's going to bring to this event that we're all going to get paid for? Because if that's sure, the case, sense that the, he apparently brought with him, yes. Because if that's the case, that's the second stupidest thing I've ever seen in wrestling. The first stupidest thing is an entire locker room full of morons who are like, you know what? Fuck WCW. I don't want to cooperate with this, and let's blow the whole invasion. Still, to me, one of the dumbest fucking things I've ever heard. Like how could like in a locker room full of guys that are like, the fans are such marks. I'm like, I'm always ready to do business. And then allegedly they're all like, Ugh, WCW, didn't we just beat these guys? I don't want to work with them. Like, you're all marks. You're all assholes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <sighs> but yeah, I just think they see Dave as a guy with a short fuse, a legitimate, you know, toughness, and somebody who's not in that top position at the moment where I think they could potentially see it as a useful moment for them. And, hey, Dave, you know, Dave what Schultz, would you do useful this guy? Idiot. Dave Schultz, useful idiot. Pretty much. So my favorite episode of this season that I had new, of, of the subject matter I knew nothing about is my other spirit animal, Herb Abrams in the UWF. Ugh. I had no idea what this was. I didn't know who, who Herb Abrams was. I had never heard of the UWF. Oh my god, this is a great story. So, this Jew walks into a bar and says, I'm starting a wrestling company. Okay, terrific. I'm going to bring in one of the killer bees, Cactus Jack, a dead guy, a guy in prison, and, you know, a handful of other ne'er-do-wells. And, okay, whatever money we make, I'm going to spend on coke and tits. Is that cool with everybody? And... No matter how bad this is going to get, I'm going to keep doing this until I die. Herb Abrams, you are my hero. Pat, your thoughts. Here's the weird part about the UWF, right? <laughs> so they had the ESPN show that they talk about where they, it was called Fury Hour. And uh, they, they got a bunch of episodes syndicated on ESPN, which is insane to think of in hindsight. They were on Sports Channel America um, for their uh, regular show. Sometime between 1991 and 1994, I have no recollection of the UWF even running any <laughs> shows during that period of time. I'm not kidding. I really don't. And a lot of the guys who were their you know, main focus area talents were all elsewhere. Like Cactus Jack is in WCW during that time for the most part. Um uh, who else is there? Uh, Bob Orton is doing Independence at that time. Orndorff winds up in WCW during that time. Uh, Doctor Death is in Japan. Bam Bam Bigelow is in the WWF. Like uh, Sid's elsewhere. Like it's all these crazy things happening at one time. So that, that by the time we finally get to this, uh, uh, what was this ill-fated pay-per-view he ran? Uh, the Blackjack Brawl, right? That was in late 1994. 
uh, that they ran at the MGM Grand <laughs> to a, to a crowd of nobody. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you can't draw in Vegas, just shut the, shut, shut it down. You know, like so. So, the, but I, I have like no recollection of them running shows between that event and their pay per view uh, that took place in like 1991. I have zero recollection of it. I was aware of the UWF and all everything, and you know some of the things they did, like when they had Andre on it. It was like, what is this? And that was one of two. Th- yeah, that was one of two things that uh, Andre did that basically had Vince uh, not acknowledge him until he died, which is sad. Um, but it was one of those two things that happened, and they uh, they, like I the UWF as a whole was a mess because they always had the like, dusty finishes to their matches that weren't a squash like you never saw like an actual winner in a high profile match um and just Herm himself was always talked about as this character and Mick Foley's book is like my main basis for finding out about like the dark side of Herb Abrams (laughs) Mick Foley's first book Have a Nice Day Um, I read that like in a week in a weekend that's a fast oh yeah for such a big book yeah it, it goes very quickly but um I remember him talking about working for Herb Abrams and like the how Herb was allegedly found covered in Vaseline and cowboy boots with these hookers while he OD'd. For such an interesting story and guy, there was very little detail in this about that, and I was actually kind of very bored with this episode. Oh my god, that's how I want to go, Pat. Covered in Vaseline, wearing cowboy boots, a bathrobe, and high the fuck on cocaine. Well, and the only the only thing that I could I could think of is that whoever wrote the movie Striptease. <laughs> was probably like a wrestling fan undercover and heard this story and like was like how do I get this into a movie because no one will believe it and there's that scene where Burt Reynolds covers himself in Vaseline and walks around in cowboy boots and there's absolutely no way that you can convince me that that was not written by someone who is familiar with the Herb Abrams story <laughs> that's amazing now I want to watch striptease um yeah I look I'm laughing, I'm having a good time talking to my buddy Pat about wrestling. I love this story, but I love a good, like, I'm a complete fucking asshole on cocaine and have every opportunity to, tr- to, to create something wonderful and I can't get out of my own way. I love a good story. I mean, like, I talked about Paul Heyman and how ECW really needed an adult running the ship. Like, let Paul be Paul. Let him, like, write the shows. But there needed to be an adult in charge. Um, I believe I've said that about AEW, that it's a fine enough product, but there needs to be an adult running the show and, you know, not throwing all of Tony Khan's money into the fucking fireplace. And here, like, I love the idea. I mean, America, say what you will about it, but it is the land of opportunity where if you, mafia money or no, have a bunch of it, and you want to go start a wrestling promotion, nothing can stop you. But have the foresight and the maturity to realize that you're just a fan and you're the money. And get get a Jim Cornette, get somebody who actually knows the fucking business to run the creative side for you. You know, run day-to-day operations because you need that. You need... If George Washington knew he needed people, I would like to think that these people throwing money behind all these various wrestling products should come to something approximating the same conclusion. You need well, we hope. <laughs> you need people who are good at those things to do those jobs. And <laughs> just because of my wacky sense of humor and my love of you know, eccentric people. I uh, I had great joy from this episode. I, I it was over, and I just had the biggest smile on my face. I'm like, you poor dumb bastard. Uh, yeah, this- I, I just for for again for the subject matter, for this ending, for everything that could have been done with this, I felt like there was very little. Yeah, and it was more history of a promotion that never really ran. Mm-hmm. Uh, all that coherent. Not even coherently, just consistently. Because, like I said, I don't remember them running any shows for like a three-year period. Well, that's the thing. I think it's like I think it's a fun story to tell. Like this is another one that would make for a good movie. It's not a good wrestling story. Like it's a good story of an asshole with money who clearly had no self-control. And there's lots of those stories out there, and they make for great entertainment. But this was not a wrestling story. 
It just happens to have wrestling in it. Yeah. But even then, for telling a story about a disturbed guy like Herb, I just I, I didn't think it was all that interesting. Okay. Did you think uh, Ozzy snorting a line of ants was interesting? Because I did. I loved Motley Crue's The Dirt. Yes, but there's a whole movie of that versus, you know, story you hear about Herb having a suite with hookers and then getting to Herb dies covered in Vaseline with hookers. <laughs> hey, before that, he jumped out a window, okay? All right. Um, from the sublime, we go to the idiotic. The last... Oh, wait, I didn't mention the boots. <laughs> yes. I, uh, I often tell the tale about how, you know, uh, the company I was working for was having trouble making, uh, making ends meet, but uh, there was somebody who thought it was a good time to, <laughs> to redo the carpet. It was kind of Herb Abrams with his boot boots. My boots are going to be what draws money. Okay. Hands up. All right. So I was really looking forward to this one. Because it was the last ride of the Road Warriors. Which, if you're talking about, like, the last ride of the Road Warriors, you're talking about 97 in the WWE, 98. Um, I don't know if they lasted into 99 or not. But, no. um so 97-98 in the WWE incorporates their re-entry where they're the classic Road Warriors. It incorporates the LOD 2000 with a repackage um, with Sonny. It incorporates the Hawk is an Alcoholic storyline. It incorporates the introduction of Draws slash Puke. And then they leave. Um... They spent most of the episode talking about their history, which if you want a more exploratory uh, show about their history, watch the, watch the WWE documentary on them, which was very well done and goes into a lot more detail. But the reason I was excited was that two-year period was really tumultuous, and I wanted uh, Joe Laurinaitis' genuine insight into... What brought him back to the WWE, especially after things went so badly for them, allegedly, in their early 90s run? Um, I would have liked to have heard their thoughts on Demolition. I don't know. If they, I don't remember if that gets covered in the, in the WWF one or, or not. Um, but I, would, I was dying to hear him talk about being repackaged with Sonny. And then instead, they so like... Here's their early history. Here's how they got together. Hawks a drunk. Hawks a drunk. Hawks a drunk. It's we're back in the WWE. Now there's an angle. Hawks a drunk. Here's draws. Hawk dies. That's the whole story. This yep. was the most lopsided fucking thing I've ever seen. This is like, well, Hawk's not here to defend himself. Joe was an angel. Hawk's an asshole. And we're going to give you Bruce Pritchard level of insight into only half of their last WWE run. This was a waste of fucking time and a really genuine disappointment for me. You know, again, as the the name of the episode would imply, we're thinking it's going to go into that last WWE run um, and kind of the ups and downs of it, really more downs than ups. I don't think there were any ups in that time. Uh, uh, showing up at WrestleMania thir- uh, 13 with the kitchen sink I thought was funny. Yeah, not really an up for a career of what's supposed to be the greatest tag team of all time. Fair enough. Um, but, again, you're thinking it's going to really focus on the, the end of the day for the career of these guys and what happened, the circumstances, why things went the way they did. No, we got a generic history of how they became the Road Warriors, how they went through this territory, this territory, this territory, and uh, they, they uh, you know, uh, Hawk, Hawk had issues, Hawk had issues, Hawk had issues. Never at any point did they reference Joe's issues, which were largely with doing jobs to people. Um, and a lot of people who've dealt with the Road Warriors over the years have said, you know, Hawk was easy, Hawk was great, we loved working with Hawk. Joe was a pain in the ass. Joe was standoffish. Joe didn't want to do a job. Joe refused to let this job be filmed uh, of them doing it so they couldn't be used against them. Like, really kind of very uh, extreme stuff, and none of that's talked about. But the end of the team and really kind of what we thought the meat of the matter would be is glossed over and really not looked upon 
uh, with any kind of regularity other than three minutes at the end of the episode where they talk about how they suggested an angle where Hawk would be falling into substance abuse and that it was supposed to eventually come out that Draws was doping him up or whatever and accidentally pushed him off the Titan Tron instead of trying to help him down. And, and what a cluster that was and how terrible it was. And that that's, that was, was the, the last... I was say, what was the resolution of that angle? Was there any? No. I remember him going off the Titan Tron and that was it. The plan was that it was supposed to be that it was going to be Hawk had been enabling... Or Draws had been enabling Hawk's abuse problems so he could take his place in the team... And that was supposed to come to light and turn Draws heel or whatever, but they uh, they just never followed up on it and were pretty much done with uh, the Road Warriors when all the negative feedback from that angle came back to them. Okay, so they they so as usual they aborted the angle with no resolution and then threw the then chopped him out to the New Age Outlaws, then threw him out. Yeah. Oh well, no, they chopped him out to the New Age Outlaws about a year before that. Okay. So it's hard to remember how often, given, given how often they were chopping, but. It's just so frustrating. Hey, who do you think were bigger bully dicks to their co-workers? The Road Warriors or the Steiners? I never heard a story about the Road Warriors uh, sodomizing anybody with a pencil. <laughs> Markers. Sharpies, sir. Sharpies. No, I heard it with a pencil from Kevin oh. Nash. Oh. Um, and I don't know which end, and I don't want to guess. Um <laughs> I, but again, the way I hear it is that Hawk was really fun. Uh, Joe was kind of a jerk, but not like somebody who was going to initiate a physical confrontation. And then there's Scott Steiner. And the funny part about all that is Scotty was seen as the normal guy, and Rick was seen as the nut. And then as Scotty grew into his persona, that went away very quickly. But I would absolutely say if there was like a team of those two who were probably more... Uh, Bullies and kind of feared it would probably be the Steiners because not only were they big and strong like the Road Warriors, but they could also tie you in knots, throw you around with suplexes, and seem to just have a more genuine, not mean streak, but like cruel streak, if that makes sense. You know, there's being roughed up in the ring, and then there's having markers shoved up your ass and taped. And I don't know how Scott, Scott if, if indeed that was Scott. And there are some that say that indeed Scott did those things. I'm not entirely sure why anyone in any locker room didn't stab him in the throat. Pretty sure the word is fear. (laughs) I suppose. Maybe we'll get a show on the Steiner Brothers and, you know, (laughs) Steiners and Shoppies. The story of the Steiner Brothers. Um... All right. We get to the glorious conclusion here. So just a ratings update here. The show does its worst numbers with the Snooker episode. Kind of surprising. You know, he killed her. Everyone knows he killed her. The man's dead now. I don't know how much interest there was in this unless you were like a big Snooker fan. Um, The highest ones are... uh, This next one we're going to talk about does does the best rating. The Final Days of Owen Hart, which is a point three four. Benoit, parts one and two, does a point three two. Uh, the Road Warriors do a point six uh, two six. Uh, Herb Abrams does a point two four, and everything does less. No, sorry. The next best one was Dave Schultz, then the um, then Herb Abrams, and then everything else is below that. Which is interesting to me. So Owen Hart is among one of my favorite wrestlers of all time, believe it or not. I always thought he was hilarious. I thought he was a great wrestler. Him and the Bulldog in Germany for the European title is one of my all-time top five favorite working matches I've ever seen. I love it. I know it was shot in the dark with a shitty camera behind a door that says Beware of the Leopard. I like I that only because it made it stand out that much more to me. But yeah, I didn't. I didn't care. Um, I I thought it was like the only other match that I've ever been glued to because of the work rate were Angle and Benoit at uh, WrestleMania 17. I just loved those matches. Um, 
Owen Hart made Bret, wa- Bret Hart watchable. Like, the, the mid-90s stuff in the WWE is some of the worst I've ever seen. <laughs> and I've watched a lot of wrestling in my time, a lot of WWF. But the Owen Hart stuff with Bret Hart was probably the highlight of that era for me. Um, the post-Montreal stuff with Owen just, you know... Just feels like, and and Cornet Cornet talked about this, like they threw him a bag of money and made him a bunch of promises, and then proceeded to fuck him all the way to his last day. And I felt like they were they had they had something with Owen, you know, well, you know, being the flag bearer for his brother, and you know, being the guy to sort of upend things. But again, it's like you had two things working against him. One. We're still talking about the same guy who, at the beginning of this episode, we were saying does no wrong and vince his eyes and gets whatever he wants. So there's the reason why that doesn't work out, Sean and Owen. And then you have Sean, and then you have rather Owen accidentally breaking Steve Austin's neck. So Austin doesn't want to do business with him anymore either. So it's well, like. And, and there's also the part where you really have to, you have to anoint Steve as the next guy. Like that has to be done. Right. And the only way that's going to correctly get over is by him going over your biggest heel, which is Sean. No, and I get that. But but Sean's going to break his back and then be summarily out for a good stretch of the late ni- of the, the, the last bit of the 90s. 98, 99, 2000, you don't see much of Shawn Michaels, if I recall. And between 98 and 99, you could have put Owen and Steve together but Steve didn't want to work with him he was like nope drop me on my head once I got my return match good enough so it's like he basically just goes back to the mid card and then they made him a goof again and it's like there's not a lot of people I feel sorry for in wrestling before the tragedy but I really felt bad for Owen because I felt like a good guy shouldn't deserve the amount of shit he got but I guess if Owen were here right now he'd say Eh, it's a living. Well, because well, again, too, and, and I think one of the things this this documentary did it established well that a lot of people don't like to talk about is that Owen wanted to get out. Right. That's what he I'm saying. Working, he, you know, he couldn't have been more opposite than Brett in that respect and that Brett was there to be the top guy, to be the best wrestler in the world. Yeah, and live, Hogan. You know, a, he wanted to be in Hogan's spot, but for a different reason than you know, Hogan, he wanted to bring wrestling to the forefront and that he was the best wrestler. Yes, Brett was um, a tech. Yeah, cool. In his head, it's real. So, <laughs> Owen was a guy who had this particular skill set and talent that he could use to make enough money in this life that he could eventually get out of it and take care of his family. Yeah, he didn't want to be like a firefighter or something like that. Like he was going. He leave. tried to get on with the city of Calgary as a firefighter. It didn't work out. Um, and then you know, and. Bruce Pritchard disputes this, but Bruce Pritchard, as we know, very often is full of shit. Yep. Um, Montreal, and they didn't really talk about this in the documentary. Montreal happens, and Owen wants out of his contract. He wants to go to WCW with Brett, Davey, and Jim because he feels if he doesn't, one, he's going to be targeted as the whipping boy for this instance, and he's not going to have any allies in the locker room, no matter how liked he is by the majority of guys. Because he's part of this contingent of people that's leaving and are leaving on terrible terms, so he's given a raise as an incentive to stay that WCW will not give him. But it's almost like, oh, well, we're not going to let you out of your contract, but we understand, Owen. Here's a heaping ton of money just to, you know, forget about everything and just be happy and, you know, go here. And, uh, you know, he works one time with Sean and it's on TV, it's not even a pay per view. Um, because wheels were already set in motion for what they were going to do with Sean. But I'm almost confused by their direction for Owen because they don't really have any. And I don't know if that's because they thought Owen would just quit and not go on and would just sit out his contract or if they legitimately just planned on keeping him out of spite. I, I don't know the reasons, but I can't see them giving him a significant raise just to keep him on the sideline as crazy as Vince can be. I was going to say, I don't know. We've seen in very, very, very recent times, there is a tendency for the WWE to pay people to not be elsewhere, whether they use them or not. 
and and again for the first uh, what is it three four months of 1998 he's essentially getting Triple H over in a program right and I guess that was ultimately what they decided they were going to do with him is just use him to get Triple H over yeah at one point he's in the nation eventually he goes there after after their initial feud he joins up with the nation because it's the whole thing of well he's got a gang I need a gang yeah and he flounders he you know he's there he's floundering and then he transitions into the tag team with Jeff Jarrett which was a good team uh but their whole purpose behind that was cuz they wanted to do an angle where it seemed like he was having an affair with Deborah McMichael which he wanted no part of because he didn't want his kids to have to, to have the feedback of going to school and saying hey why's your dad with that lady on TV uh yeah. even though they know it's a show it's different I mean that, that and and the, here's the thing the Owen Hart story is sad not just because of the tragedy of what happened to him though that's the biggest part but secondary to that the stuff that happened to Owen Hart between Montreal and No Way Out is the story of a lot of wrestlers in the WWE hey we have garbage we'd like you to do well I don't want to do garbage well then you're going to get punished they never say it that clearly but that's what happens and that's what happened here when they started making him do the blue blazer gimmick again which for those who didn't know, Owen had portrayed this character in the late '80s as kind of a means to get his foot in the door in the WWF, and was it wasn't even a goofy superhero character then. It was just a guy who's a masked wrestler. Like was that wasn't lucha. an uncommon thing. Yeah, he was a white lucha. That's what it was. Yeah. However, in this day and age, in the Attitude Era, the masked wrestler was not common unless you were in WCW from Mexico. Um, so they had him do it as a parody of you know the Hulk Hogan stereotype of all American good guy and such in a way where it would look like he was bumbling in a buffoon and Owen played along with it and did it and basically and they they don't reference this at all in the documentary which I was kind of shocked by the night where he took his fall um, his his fatal fall um, the whole purpose of that lowering from the arena was going to be so they could knock Sting because he was supposed to come down in this elaborate entrance and as soon as he stepped in the ring he was supposed to trip on his cape that was the payoff to him being lowered from, you know, 100 feet in the air, whatever it was. That was the payoff to it. He was going to step on his cape and trip. So, a couple of things. One, the night Owen died, I was actually watching on pay-per-view. I was living in Los Angeles at the time. And he falls, and... I, you know, as they're telling you what happens, um, I remember, this is May of 1999, I remember my reaction being horrified, and I remember Jim Ross coming back, and I'm like, hey, this is not, you know, he's in his serious voice, but not like Mick Foley and Terry Funk fucking falling in a, in a fucking dumpster, serious voice, like his actual serious voice. He's like, this isn't part of the show. Like, the guy fell. And I was horrified. And I remember thinking, like, they gotta stop the show, right? They can't fucking wrestle after a guy, like, has a horrible accident like that. And they go to, they, they throw it to Jeff Jarrett, who's supposed to promo of his all, match. Of all people. <laughs> it's like, yeah. They throw it to Jeff Jarrett, who does a promo, who's, like, half screaming about the wrestler he's supposed to fight. And half crying that Owens, you know, had a horrible accident. And Deborah McMichael is, like, trying to, like, half keep it together and stay in character. And she's crying about Owen. Like, it was really surreal. And had anybody had any fucking brains, they would have never have done that. Like, at that point, you just, you go to the truck and you're like, whatever, throw porno up. Throw something. Throw up squirrels fucking running in a tree. Do don't show the crowd. Don't go to Jim Ross. Stop doing interviews. Throw up canned footage until we get this mess sorted out. You don't fucking. Hey, listen. I know your buddy just died and there's a horrible accident and everyone's traumatized. But three, two, one. You hate the Undertaker. Go. The fuck. And I remember thinking, what the fuck at the time? Like, well, that's really odd. Fast forward a little bit later in the show, and the show's still going, by the way. And they throw it to Jim Ross, 
And there's Jerry L- Jerry Lawler, who's like trying to not cry on camera, and they're like, Owen Hart's dead. And I don't give a shit what anyone thinks of me. I'm bawling my fucking eyes out at this point. I am inconsolable. And I remember like getting through the stupid show that they insisted on finishing because quote fans will riot um which would not have happened they'd have been like sorry guy died time to go home we'll honor your tickets we'll refund your money we'll send you flowers you'll get a, whatever everyone get the fuck out that's how normal people would have handled this but dense so the next night they do the Owen Hart Memorial they open with the bells the show starts my friend John who Pat had the dubious honor of meeting last year at WrestleMania calls me up we don't say a word to each other we're just both crying like for the first five to ten minutes of that phone call all there is is sobbing and sobbing and breathing and crying and just nothing we just cried into the phone together and I remember like my uncle and I was telling him like oh my god this horrible thing happened this wrestler died and he fucking fell from the roof of uh, a basketball arena and I'm really really like broken up about it it's super sad and my uncle's like wow you didn't know him so (laughs) that was your Mickey Mantle doesn't pay my rent moment (laughs) pretty much so those are my memories of the night of and the night after Owen Hart uh, passed away. How about you? So I was watching the pay-per-view with my two cousins, uh, one who's older, one who's younger. And my older cousin was always uh, a wrestling fan, watched regularly when his parents would let him. Uh, my younger cousin, not so much, but my younger cousin had one particular favorite wrestler, and that was Owen. I think it was just because he related to being the little brother uh, and kind of in the shadow of the older brother and older cousin in certain respects. So he was always just an Owen fan. Loved Owen Hart. So my dad is in the living room watching a movie that premiered that night called The Jesse Ventura Story. (laughs) I remember that. That was on the that was on the same night. (laughs) And uh so he's outside taping that, and I'll watch that tomorrow while I'm inside taping this pay-per-view that he'll watch tomorrow while I'm at school. And we like are watching the show, and they make an announcement that Owen Hart has fallen. And it was supposed to be a stunt. And you got to remember, this is at the time when they're doing a lot of very extreme things. Hawk falling off the Titan Tron, you know, things like that. And we're like, Where I don't know. It's, we're within a year of, like, Shane's Dive of the Week, aren't we? Uh, it's coming up, yeah. Uh, after this, of course. But before this, I, I like I distinctly, like, the most extreme thing I remember them doing in terms of stuff like that is, like, Hawks fall from the Titan Tron. Right. So this is one of those things where, like, this could be part of the show. I don't know about this, you know. And uh, then, you know, they go to the Jeff Jarrett interview that ends with Owen, I'm praying for you. And he's crying, and we're like, I don't think this is part of the show anymore. And we're not even, you know, paying attention to the matches or anything. We're like, I wonder, like, what's going on with Owen Hart? And then they come back after that, and like you said, that image of Jerry Lawler trying just not to break down. Jim Ross just looking like he has the worst moment of his life. And at that point in time, it probably was. I would imagine Jim Ross contemplated walking off the show. Yeah, I would imagine a lot of guys did. Because you can see Lawler is just despondent and does not want to say anything. No, Lawler didn't want to be there. Yeah, and... Like, who would, though? You watch the guy die. Yeah. Fucking fall to his death. And uh, they they do the... You know, and I have the unfortunate uh, news of telling you that Owen Hart has died. And you're just like, what? You're more in shock and kind of numb at that point than anything. And like so, like I, I'm like, so literally, like at that point, we go out to tell my dad, like, Dad, Owen Hart's dead, and he's like, what? We're like, you know, he fell in the show, and they they talked about it, and we didn't know if it was real or not, 
but they just said Owen Hart's dead. So he went to the other TV in his bedroom and I guess turned the news on or whatever. And the news, and it was like breaking news, like on Channel Seven in New York, and you know Channel Two, and all the regular news channels. Like, yeah, that was the real thing. And uh, I remember going to school the next day because at the time I was, I was still going to you know school, and uh, you know all my friends were wrestling fans, and we we're all just talking like, "Hey, did you watch the show last night? Did you watch?" Because if you didn't watch the show, you woke up to the news with your parents telling you like, "Hey, you know this guy fell last night." And we were all just kind of like in shock. And uh, I th- I'm trying to remember exactly how it went down, but we basically had our teacher stop the class because there were so many of us who were wrestling fans at the time. And my class was maybe about 27, 28 kids. And I would say of them, probably about 15 were avid wrestling fans to the point where this was really like consuming our morning. And like right. she had to, she had to stop the class. Yeah, and there's just, no like, learning getting done on that day basically talk us through the incident ask us what happened how that made us feel and and it basically kind of controlled the majority of the day at that point and we went home all of us and you know as is normal we watch Monday Night Raw and they're doing the Raw is Owen thing and I'm doing okay during it and then Jeff Jarrett starts talking and I just start losing it because Jeff Jarrett's not acting. He's talking about how this guy is actually his friend, even though you're around all these guys, and he just can't keep it together. No, Jeff was not composed. It was one of those where I think he at one point said, turn the camera off. Yeah, and then like I, I went from that to, I think it was on, I think it was Triple H and China were talking after that, and I got so angry hmm. because like I was I was just consumed with rage. I was like, you did that shit to his brother, and now you want to talk about him? You <laughs> son of... And I got so angry that my dad turned Monday Night Raw off. He was like, you're not watching this anymore. Hmm. And he didn't mean forever. He meant that night because right. he could see I was in an emotional state and just got so angry. Um, because I also didn't go to... I didn't pay to go to a WWE event for years after the Montreal screw job because I felt slighted and I felt wronged by that. Um but this like it went from just being ultimately like feeling so depressed for for Jeff Jarrett and like this guy I knew who was this entertainer and like hearing about what a loving family man he is and everything is gone to like hearing somebody I felt was completely insincere at the time and I don't think they were I just think it was bad timing uh I really don't believe they were insincere I do think they cared about Owen as a person and liked him but it just left a bad taste in my mouth and I had lost it because I was in such an emotional state yeah, it's a, it's a weird, semi-abusive relationship when you're a fan of the WWF, WWE. At least for me, because I know the company is garbage. The company covers up murders, it fucks people. They have legitimately done things to. Uh, I mean, the the wrestlers make choices, but the co- the company in and of itself has just done some really shitty things in between the murder and uh, and and this. And it's like they've done some halfway decent things too, and they've obviously provided moments that brought joy to my life, and so it's like. I, it's hard because, like, I, I, I've talked about this with my wife. Like, I want to not like this company and not watch it anymore. But occasionally there's a Daniel Bryan wins the title at WrestleMania 30 moment that legitimately brings joy to my life. You know, it's one of those where despite what garbage this company is and the people that run it are, like, that guy who should never have won, you know, been in a main event at a WrestleMania did. And was given a recognition of his talent. You know, or a WrestleMania 20 moment with Benoit and Guerrero. Yeah, you can't let, you know, hindsight ruin, which was at the time an incredible moment for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So, Um, I I shouldn't say ruin it, I should say take away what it meant at that time in that moment. You know, the perception of it now is obviously very different, but 
at that moment in time, it was a, a watershed moment for a lot of people. Yeah, I, I kind of, it's it's like, you know, like a band or an actor or, or or whatever. Like, well, you personally may be garbage, but this thing you did is really special and brought joy to me. So I, I kind of have to separate the company from the moment, but there's no. There's no forgiving. There's no, look, you know, look, seeing it from the WWE's point of view, and that's what I was really looking forward to in this. Your cat seems to want to be in on the podcast. Ask your cat what she thought of uh, Uncle um, Owen Hart. Yeah, she's uh, she's very upset by that. She she doesn't like when we talk about it. Apparently, <coughs> um, I heard you, Val. What? Are yeah. You... Um, to your point, with that that end of it. It's like every time I see the put Owen Hart in WWE Hall of Fame thing. No. I, I just, I get angry. And I'm like, do you not understand that this company is responsible no matter how you slice it for his death? And that's what like, I wanted to see in this documentary. And they touch on it, and they kind of, they talk about it, but I never got, I, I wanted the, like, I feel like with Snooka, they really broke it down. And... They did everything but flash a bright neon sign that said, Vince covered up the murder of Nancy by Jimmy Snuka. And this, they're like, again, they kind of point to it. They talk about the, they talk about the lock, the, um, uh, the harness. But then they're like, they run away from it again. And you, you do leave with the impression that this is clearly the WWE's fault and there was gross negligence and they basically murdered a guy on pay-per-view but I wish I wish it had been more damning I wish it had been I, more direct yeah. I, I I really wish they would have painted with a more uh, a less broad brush in this and really went after the fact that hey WWE was negligent they did not do everything they needed to do in terms of safety to make sure that this was going to be okay versus the risk they were taking and the potential for disaster which is exactly what we got at its worst because not for uh, nothing, but they dropped Sting out of the fucking rafters, like, every day in 1998. Like, it was ridiculous. Yeah, and they had done, again, they had done this stunt with Owen before, which they go into, but they didn't like how it looked with him in a harness, which is absurd. So we're going to disqualify safety for a visual that you're barely going to see because of how it's going to look when he's descending. But that's so Vince, though, isn't it, Pat? It's like, ugh. That looks like garbage. The next time Owen goes up, can we just have him hanging by, like, a coat hanger and a string? Yeah, it is. That's the sad part. It really is. Um, but but like we are talking about, in terms of them really pointing a finger the way they did at Jimmy Snuka, where there's pretty much indisputable evidence, they needed to do that here a little bit more. And one of the more telling things, I think, and kind of shows you to me in a lot of ways the character of someone like Bret Hart Brett's all over the Montreal episode, interview him constantly, talk to him constantly. He's nowhere to be found in this episode. In an episode that produced by people he knows who he's worked with about his own story, doesn't have anything to do with the story of his brother. Well, not for nothing, but like whatever members of the Hart family that did not stand with Owen's wife. Which is uh, uh, notably Diana, who was the widow of the British Bulldog she was mo- she was very uh, adamantly pro WWE during this time um, it, which is very sad in many ways um, I, she is one of the known ones um, I believe Bruce Hart was trying to uh, leverage some type of relationship with WWE again and this is the sad part because at the time Brett was very much on Martha's side was making appearances on her behalf and you know basically talking about it during, was constantly in contact with Martha and one of the things Martha said was during this whole thing as it was going on she kind of was asked by Brett hey while this is going on this is happening do you think you can get my footage rights back so yeah the Hart family is um, a lot of garbage people a lot of nuts a lot of nuts, a lot of garbage people, and I have like zero well, respect for Bret here, Hart. Here's the thing, too, and I don't want to just paint that family with a broad brush of being garbage because they're they're not all of them. Good, no, there's 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 some good people in there. Um, 
you know, like the, the basically the generation of kids right now, like uh, the Harry Smith, the the Natties, the TJs, you know, the Georgias, that they, they, who really had nothing to do with this and are just kind of innocent bystanders. Um, I think they need to not be painted with that brush. No, but... and look, what I'm saying is if the if Owen's wife's contemporaries in that family should have stood with her or been silent. Oh, 100%. And I don't and, think anybody I don't think anybody who's listening to this is going to disagree with that. Right. But what I'm I, saying I also... is those contemporaries who actively worked against worked against her are garbage people. Oh yeah, uh, and again, we know who they were because they've come out and said as such. Um and even even in hindsight now, you look at Brett, who stood firmly by Martha at the time, asked her, hey, could you work out this while you're doing that, which is uh, so absurd on so many levels. Um, and then that didn't happen. Uh, so Brett and her just stopped talking at a certain point. Then years later, uh, Brett makes the very stupid comment that Martha's trying to erase Owen's legacy. <laughs> Um, which I, I don't think he could have said a more stupid or ignorant thing if he tried. Um, the fact that Owen Hart's legacy is now the Owen Hart Foundation that does so many things for children and, you know, in need families across Canada um, means so much more than Owen being a great professional wrestler. Right. The subtext here is there's life beyond the WWE and its retarded Hall of Fame. Like there's all kinds of things, immeasurable things that you like, can I do highly... to exalt Owen and make sure his name resonates for years to come. He doesn't need to be in the stupid Hall of Fame. Yeah, like I highly advocate uh, listening to the Talk Is Jericho podcast with Martha on it that was just recorded uh, prior to this uh, episode coming out. Um, I'm generally not a huge fan of Jericho's podcast because he kind of Steve Austin's it a little bit. But this one, he really was very respectful, uh, had a lot prepared to speak about with Martha Hart. Um, and I think it's very much worth listening to, especially if you watch the episode um, where she goes into things in more detail. Um, and, and again, during during the course of this, I don't know that anybody can go from as likable as Brett, where he's standing by his brother's widow. You know, at the funeral, he bear hugs her to make sure she's OK and try to get her through it. And again, this wasn't included on the documentary, but it was included on the Talk is Jericho podcast. He asked her about getting his film footage rights. And then when that doesn't happen, they stop talking. And all of a sudden, he's cool with Vince again and eventually starts working for him. And just everybody who uh, was a Brett fan and stood by him through all that basically got spit on by Brett. Um, and I'm among them. So, yeah, I take it a little bit personal. Sure. Listen, it isn't just this. That we're discussing that specifically that makes me not respect Bret Hart. There's a lot about Bret Hart I'm not fond of. I don't care that he's a good wrestler. <clears throat> I really, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of good things Bret did, but to me, he's always come across as an entitled lunatic. And this is just one of those examples. Um, I want to say this with reference to the episode. Um,. I had two incidents where I really, like, broke down watching Dark Side of the Ring. The first was seconds into the Benoit episode, where they showed Nancy and Chris's wedding. I don't know what it is about the image of weddings in certain circumstances, but, like, I can't handle it at times, and I just started bawling. Like, literally, like, I, I looked at my wife, like, we're going to watch the Benoit documentary. Okay, I'm probably not going to do well with this. I'm here for you. Okay, footage of the wedding. Balling already. She's like, that didn't last long at all. Um, when I watched the Owen Hart one by myself, and like I was mentally a little bit more prepared for this. I was like, I, you know, I really wanted to hear what Martha had to say about the negligence that killed her husband. And the first time Oge opens up his mouth on this show, and he starts talking about what a great dad Owen was, I'm about over the subject of dead dads. I can't fucking handle it, man. <laughs> For personal reasons alone, I'm having real difficulties with this. And so Oge talking about his relationship with his father and what a great dad he was, and knowing that this asshole company 
made asshole decisions that took this child's father away from him makes me so sad. And it was very hard to watch. When he talks about the the last time Owen left and they pick up uh, his his grandmother to go to the airport with him and Oge, Oge takes the ride with Owen and Owen says to him, take care of your mom. And that's the last thing he said to him. That was hard. Yeah. That was very, very hard. I'm wondering if he knew, like, like they talk about, like, the spot was, like, written in that day. But I'm wondering if the timeline's a little funky and he knew that he had to do another rigging descent and he just had a bad feeling about it. He, he just, just based on everything that's been said about him, and not just in this documentary, but over the years by people who generally nobody has a single bad word to say about him as a person, um, which is the ultimate rarity in wrestling. Usually everybody has a reason to hate somebody. Nobody seemingly had a reason to dislike Owen Hart. Um, so to hear what, like how much his family meant to him, he may have just had the idea that every time he left, he needed to say something like that to, sure. to just, I, I don't know, for whatever superstition or purpose, what have you, it may have just been something in him. And that one's one that Oge remembers just because of obviously what followed um, and I remember it's A and E did bi- a biography on Owen, uh, maybe like a year after he had died. It was very short in terms of his death, and then the premiere of the program. And Martha, I remember Martha talking about how when he left, he was leaving, walked out the door, and then just came back and just gave her a big kiss, and she just breaks down crying. And that that just always echoed in the back of my head during this episode like just remembering her talking about that it was it, it just was very hard to watch at points because this is a good man who got killed in a needless stupid stunt and by a very bad company and a very bad business um i think it's a good episode i don't think it's their best i and I, and it i don't think it's their fault i think when you're talking about lawsuits and details there's only so much um so much you're allowed to say. Also, it's a 45 minute documentary with commercials. There's only so much you can get into, and you have to give some background on these people. Um, overall, that's why the Benoit thing needed two two hours. Overall, I thought uh, the season was okay to good. Um, some issues here and there. Uh, like I said, I don't think the series takes a strong point of view other than, as I said earlier, kind of, here's wrestling. It is what it is. And they let the people tell the story. Um, I think this might have worked better um, with an extra 15 minutes. Like, if they had been able to do this on HBO or, you know, some sort of paid cable where they don't have to deal with commercials. Um... They're also confined by the people that will talk to them. You know, they, they, many times they can't get people who have a current relationship with the WWE, and that's a lot of their content. So you're kind of left with... And, here, and well, here's what I've noticed listening to a variety of wrestling podcasts over the last couple of years. Some of these guys were great performers, but have no ability to give any kind of insight they can repeat what they remember to be the facts of a story. Mm-hmm. But when you ask them for like, think about the why and the, the why this happened. And can you give insight into how people are thinking? They are fucking lost. And that's one of the deficits of the show is you're talking to a lot of people with not a lot of depth. So, yeah. I'll give you the final word on this, and then let's talk about next season if there's going to be one. I, I think this season is very peak and valleyish. I think the good episodes in the season are very good. Like I, I really enjoyed the the Snook episode, the Dino Bravo episode. Um, I think there's good depth in there. I think there's unrevealed details in a lot of them that were news to people. I think the episodes of this season that were not great, the episodes like the Road Warriors, um, the UWF they definitely felt like filler just to stretch out an episode order and I could have done without them. Um, and, and again, you're not going to hit a home run out of the park every time with a lot of these because a lot of these things are 
that we're talking about have been circulated as urban legend for years that they're just trying to find out. Um, so it's not going to be great every time. A lot of times it's going to be sketchy details. I would almost like them going into, if they're going to do that, kind of debunking some things uh, as opposed to just trying to find a story where there may not be one every time, like with the Road Warriors episode. or They really didn't have a full episode worth of the Herb Abrams stuff either. It just dragged and was filler. Um, so I think they need to kind of look more into that aspect of it too if they're going to continue. So here's my... Top five nominations for Dark Side of the Ring Season 3. All right? You get your list. I'm going to get my list. Here we go. In no particular order, here's what I want to see. I want to see an episode in an XPW. Rob Zakari went to prison for distributing porn. I'm sure, since he's gotten out of prison now, I think he only did a year at the time, he would love to be on camera and talk about the shit show that was XPW. Um, that would be that's a hilarious episode uh, I'm hoping to god I'm not in any of the footage because I was on an episode or two of their oh, weekly boy. TV show yeah uh, I did some fun stuff with that company so for personal reasons there's uh, nothing else but I think the story of the porn company that ECW turned away and like a you know, and like a spurned woman decided to start their own company out of the dregs that was the Southern California wrestling scene, I think would be hilarious and wildly entertaining. So yeah, XPW, do it. Frightening. <laughs> Magnum TA. Um, there's already a lot, of, a lot of information out there about his sort of rise to stardom and just before he could really blow up having a horrible motorcycle accident. But I think it's a story worth telling and at least he's still alive, isn't he? Yes, Magnum's still alive. So he'd be one to kind of talk to, and I think his story is worth sharing. Uh, Kurt Henning, WWE, did a documentary on him. It's fucking sad. Um, but I think his is a story worth telling. He was sort of a wrestling genius, and he's another one who partied hard and um, that's, burned out. That's more what I would like to hear from, like, from his peers, like, the legendary, like, pranks. Because he's apparently, like, the prankster of all pranksters. Mm -hmm. so, like, yeah, almost like an episode that's a little more lighthearted with, like, who he was on the road and stuff would be fun for me. Um, Scott Hall fucking murdered a guy and traumatized him for life. And caused, it was a big cause of a lot of his substance abuse issues. He has allegedly turned it all around and been a halfway decent dad to, uh, to the child that's currently wrestling on the independent scene. Um, he did the DDP rehabilitation plan. Um, so I think Scott Hall would make for an interesting subject. And not that we haven't gotten enough of this in the fall in the rise and fall of WCW and various other documentaries, but well, what the hell? Let's do it again. Black Saturday, which is where. Uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling fucked off for a period of time and was WWF. And the great people of the South said, what the hell happened to my wrestling? And then Vince sold the TV rights back to whoever, then used it to pay for WrestleMania, which subsequently did uh, uh, a lot of financial damage to Crockett Promotions. It's hilarious. We need to we need to hear the story one more time. Uh Black Saturday, what do you think, Pat? Um so if I had my five episodes I could do uh one would definitely be on Gentleman Chris Adams. Um and there's already a documentary made about him called Gentleman's Choice. Um I don't know if anybody's seen it. It was very low circulated, so um I think there's potential there, but just like they have a countless amount of doc, Von Eric documentaries and such, um, I think one about G, uh, Chris Hernandez or Chris Adams would be tremendous because, much in the same way I said nobody really ever has a negative thing to say about Owen Hart, nobody has a positive thing to say about Chris Adams. <laughs> really, better, worse than Eddie Mansfield, huh? Uh, really, really bad. Like nobody has a positive thing to say about this guy. Um, and I remember him very well and very vividly from watching the GWF in Texas, world class, and then he showed up in WCW in later years. Um, real, real interesting story there. Um, that would be number one. Number two for me would be 
uh, kind of a, a multifaceted episode about the divergent career and life paths of the three divas, the original divas of Sable, uh, China, and Sunny. I'm for that. Um, I think it's just a very interesting juxtaposition of those three women who gained that stardom at that same time and where it took them. Um, I think that could be very, very interesting. Uh, in that same token, but I think she deserves her own episode for it, would be Missy Hyatt. Yeah, for sure. Um, I just think there's a huge story there. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number four would probably be, and again, there was already a documentary produced on him, but it wasn't really on the dark side of things, but the Dynamite Kid. Okay. I think he's a very interesting figure in terms of, like, he's looked at for a lot of things. He's looked at as this great revolutionary junior heavyweight worker. He's looked at as this, like, little bully backstage with all these uh, incidents that, that occurred, um, you know, like with Jacques Rougeau and a whole bunch of other things and where his life went. Um, I think there's a very interesting story to tell there. And number five, we'll never get it. But I'm, you know, you're talking about scandals. I would go with the Terry Garvin, Pat Patterson, Ring Boy scandal. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> no, sir. We'll, we'll never get it, of course, because one, uh, I don't think anybody's willing to say anything negative about Pat Patterson other than Lanny Poffo. And, uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> unfortunately, we'll, we'll never get that, and that's a shame. But the, the, only, the only other one, and I'll, I'll cheat here and throw a sixth in, would be one on the click. Really? Because we already got the WWE documentary, The Click Rules, which is basically a vanity piece trying to exonerate them, uh, which is absurd on many levels. The only negative with it is would be you'll never get Triple H on it. You'll never get Sean on it. There's a very good chance you won't get Kevin Nash on it. You may only get Scott Hall, Sean Waltman on it. And that's a very big if in Waltman because he's reliant upon Triple H for a lot of his income. Um and largely I can't help but see anybody else being interviewed on that documentary having just only negative things to say <laughs> and they, they've they really tried to avoid being a biased kind of report <laughs> okay so I'm shocked I'm shocked you didn't say Mid-South I think okay well I think if you're going to talk Bill Watts you wouldn't necessarily be talking about that so much as you would talk about his year and a half reign in WCW maybe just one on Bill Watts then yeah Bill Watts and WCW would be probably the one um, the other one I'm really shocked because we brought it up earlier I'm actually surprised you didn't suggest the Steiner Brothers I, there's not really a dark side there they're just fun guys misunderstood shoving markers up people's asses it's fine threatening to kill Hulk Hogan you know, yeah, like you do. I mean, Jesus Christ, who hasn't threatened to kill Hulk Hogan? Yeah, um, serious. Come on, it's not just Scotty. So we're both racist and mentioned nobody black. So here, so I, uh, uh, for the sake of inclusion, Junkyard Dog. What do you think? I, I don't think that's necessarily like a scandalous thing. I think it's just you know he was a huge star. He died who, tragically. That's that's a motif with the show. I, I guess, but he you know he died in a car wreck, you know, while falling asleep at the wheel. He wasn't under the influence or anything. And I don't think there's much of a story there, other than if you're going to celebrate the dog for being this huge star who broke barriers. I mean, he kind of has a tragic story. He's a he, you know he's a big star in the uh, Louisiana territory, and he goes to WWE, uh, becomes a racial stereotype stereotype, and gets fat, and then he goes back to the independent scene and dies in a car wreck. Well, I don't see the the stereotype aspect of it. I, but you know the the fat thing, yeah, that happened because they started calling him in the newsletters the junk food dog. <laughs> I, I here's the thing, like if you look at JYD in his you know in his like mid south years, he was ripped to shreds and he looked like he was going to murder somebody, and then for him to have gotten like that fat and lazy on the being on the road with the WWF. For you know, nine hundred days a year, I would like to hear some insight as to how what was his like mentality like. He got paid a lot of money and didn't have to work as hard. <laughs> Just fucking shimmy his knees and yell, uh, grab them cakes. There you go, <laughs> um, Kamala. Um, 
I feel like if you couldn't get him in it, then it's not going to be a good story. He's still with. No, oh, wait, did he pass? I don't remember. Yes, I'm, I'm okay. pretty sure he did. Yeah, he. Um, I knew he had diabetes there at the end, and he like lost his feet and everything. And knowing you, I will say I'm surprised you didn't say Abdul the Butcher. <laughs> that would be a great story. I have personal stories of Abby. Yeah, between that, between the hepatitis C case with um, <laughs> what's his name in Canada, uh, Hannibal. Um, you know, I, I feel like that's one where, and he because he was very controversial through his career that people, I don't think people understand that now in hindsight mm-hmm. that Abdullah the Butcher was extremely controversial because he was known for just blood. Yeah, I think Abby would actually be of the three that we've talked about. Would be the best one. Blackbird twenty two, who uh, we who likes to follow my stuff and we chat occasionally on Twitter. Uh, he agrees with the Dynamite Kid. He suggested Gorgeous George, but like, who would you get to talk about it? The man, you know, <laughs> the, the guy wrestled in the fifties. That's that's the hard part because there's great stuff too from the past, like Ricky Dozan, <laughs> Japan. Um, the, you know, the story of him and his murder, which is essentially a Bruiser Brody type situation before, you know, 30 years before Bruiser Brody happened. Um, Ricky Dozan would be a great one, but who are you going to talk to? First of all, they're all Japanese or Korean. Second of all, I don't think any of them are still alive who are involved in anything that went on then. And again, it's, you know, in Japan, there's a big thing called Kinjite where it's a forbidden subject. You don't talk about it. Um, the other one he suggested was AWA. Which, I don't know what the story is. Vern's a fucking asshole who wouldn't get with the times. That's the story of the AWA. <laughs> they trained all the great wrestlers of the 80s and early 90s. Without the AWA, you wouldn't have had the WWF. And it went away because Vern Gagne was an asshole. I'm not sure there's a story here. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. If we're going that route, you could say Marty Jannetty's Facebook. <laughs> Well, there's some dark sides. <laughs> <coughs> All right, that's the sign that I need to call it a night. So... I killed Mark, everybody. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, Pat, this was a lot of fun. I'm glad we did this. A little longer, <clears throat> little longer than normal, but it was a lot of subject matter we needed to talk about. So it is what it is. But I'm glad we did it. All right, uh, this past week. Speaking of long podcasts, myself, Alexis Haina, and Robert Winfrey reviewed Scoob. And then the day before that, myself and Alexis Haina reviewed the final season of she Season 5. Next week, we'll be doing a live source material for the Three Caballeros right again. Myself and Chris Bailey will be reviewing AEW Double or Nothing. Ugh. <laughs> and myself and Alexis Haina... We'll be doing a TV party for the Three Caballeros. If you've never heard Pat before and you enjoyed him tonight, you can check out him and I uh, in our boxing series. We're up to Chapter 7. That was the last one that was released. We talked about the WBA heavyweight elimination scramble for Ali's title. And the next time I'll have Pat on will be June 4th for Chapter 8. Smoking Joe Frazier. So that's my plugs. Well, what do you got going on? No, that's pretty much it. All righty. Did you have a good time tonight, Pat? I had a great time as always. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. For Pat Mullen, this has been uh, the Rattle Legend Broadcasting Network's TV party tonight. Be well, be safe, and behave. 